What is up? How's it going? This is Kazi from CleverProgrammer.com. What I wanted to cover in this series is Django. And uh, what I wanted to cover was like the most commonly referenced Django documentation. I personally couldn't really find any videos of people like covering it. So I just wanted to do that because, you know, I see like everybody who starts learning Django, this is the first place you're going to go to like the docs, the Django official documentation that shows you how to, you know, do their getting started guide. And so I just want to kind of cover that in this series. And this right now, I just want to kind of cover the overview. And then we're going to jump into actually uh, the parts of the tutorial. Okay, and you, you're just going to follow me along. All right, so um, I'm going to cover this kind of touch on this. So if you have some experience with it, it will make a little bit of sense. So designing your models. So in Django, you can kind of design your database and models like this. You don't need to type in raw SQL queries or mess with too many ORM, ORMs. It's just simply classes. So it's literally like Python and object oriented programming and boom, you have stuff populating your database, which is pretty cool. Uh, it also has a built in kind of API. So it says, you know, as soon as your models are done, the API is created on the fly, no code generation necessary. Okay, so here you can see that if you create a model, like let's say that you're creating an app, right, it has reporters, and your app has articles, um, you know, well, what you can just do is just be like, hey, reporter.objects.all, and it'll tell you how many reporters are there. For example, if you made a game app for like, let's say Street Fighter, and you did fighter.objects.all, it might say empty set, which means you didn't put in any fighters yet, right? But then let's say you create a fighter or a reporter with the name John Smith, and you save it, uh, then when you check objects at all, all of a sudden it'll say, hey, reporter John Smith actually does exist. So that's pretty cool and a really nice way to interface with it. And then also you can search for things in a really easy way too. So you can search in your database with an ID, but you know, a lot of the times a more human way to search instead of an ID is like searching with what does the name start with or if the name contains the word myth, which Smith actually contains and it'll match it. So then what you can do on your front end later is right now, like you're not going to have your client interface with your app from the code command line, right? What you can do later is then give them a front end and interface so then they can actually type it in the search bar and look up John Smith or type in myth and they'll still find John Smith. Kind of like when you guys go to like Shopify stores or you know YouTube and type in a video's name and even if you're off, they'll still find it. It's using this contained search mechanism which Django comes built in with. Um, Another thing I want to touch on is, um, yeah, so if you have your model, you can register them in the admin interface with just this simple line that says admin.site.register. And then that model, so let's say you created the article model, you can now register it in the admin interface. So then you can go and point and click in the admin interface and then delete or create new articles or whatnot, right? For example, when you have a WordPress blog, you know how you have an admin interface there and you can create a new blog post or delete a post or edit. You have full CRUD functionality. Well, that's what it mimics by you just doing this, right? And that's you creating code from scratch. That's kind of powerful. And then um, obviously it lets you design your URLs, right? So how do you want your URLs to be? So for example, you can have it like you know, myapp.com slash articles slash the year followed by whatever, right? So you can create your own URL uh, parameters and whatever. So this is pretty standard, but um, it Django lets you do it in a really clean way, especially with Django 2.0, their new latest release. All right, so uh, writing your views is also pretty easy. You can have it just like return a HTTP response or uh, HTML file you made. So for example, here you can see we render and return like this archive.html file. So if you create a HTML file in your templates, then it's gonna be there. Again, if you're watching this and you're like, I'm a complete beginner and I have no idea what the heck you're talking about, don't worry. 
uh, if this part is just not making any sense, skip a little bit ahead to the part where we jump into the tutorial. This is just for people who are maybe coming from other frameworks and they want to grasp how Python and Django is working. Okay, so you do need some experience to understand what I'm talking about here. And then yeah, templates are uh, using it's it's using Django templates, which is kind of like Jinja. Um, I'll go into this later. So at this point, like, let's just get started. All right, so for your installation, all you really need to do is make sure you have Python installed. So for myself, I got Anaconda installed, which is, I, which is what I would recommend for you. So if you do Anaconda download online, kind of install that. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to go on and uh, then obviously install Django as well, which I'll show you in one second, okay? All right, and then you can go ahead and create a project. So we're gonna just get started from scratch and follow along with this tutorial. So let's, let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna open up my command line here. So I'm just gonna open up my terminal. If you're watching this, you can open up your, um, you know, CMD on Windows. Um, or what I recommend installing is CMDER on your Windows. And uh, yeah, basically just see if you have Anaconda installed. And if you do, and if you type in Conda, this, this thing should come up, okay? If you don't have Anaconda installed, that's okay. You can still follow me along. But what I'm doing here is kind of like for best practice. So if you wanna do it like the best practice way, then I recommend that you get Conda installed here. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. All right, so basically what I wanna do here is um, first check my, so what I'm gonna do is install my environment with Conda, okay? So I'm gonna do, um, and, and again, installing Anaconda and like making you understand everything about virtual environments is outside the scope of this specific tutorial. So you can look up stuff like how to install Anaconda on Windows or how to install Anaconda on a Mac. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and do Conda or first I'm going to create this project. So let's see, I'm going to go to my GitHub. All right, what I've also done is I have gone into preferences in my Atom and um, I have went in under install and I've installed uh, terminal, platformio IDE terminal, and I've installed it. So then the beauty of that is that when I'm coding, right, if I'm coding, I can just pop open my terminal right in here and I don't have to leave my atom. So I will do Django admin start project my site like that and then go into my site okay and then I will come over here and I will open I'll go to github and then I'll go my site and then just click that okay that's about it this is just so if you guys are following along, like I don't want you to get confused. Okay, I'm gonna open up my Chrome. So they're saying that this is pretty much what it should look like, and for us, it does look like that, right? We have my site, and it has all these files inside of it, and you can see my site, and it has all these files inside of that. Okay. Um, and then they say, hey, just go ahead and run python manage.py run server. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So I'm gonna open up my terminal. And how I do that, how I open up the little prompt is by doing command shift P. Uh, for you on Windows, that might be a different command, like maybe control shift P. Um, but yeah, for me, that opens it up and then I just click terminal, pops open my terminal. I'm gonna do conda create dash dash name my site python is equal to 3.6 and i will activate this environment okay and now i will install django
Okay. So if I do pip freeze, it should show me that Django and a bunch of other stuff is installed. Uh, Django right here. So we're good. All right, I'm just going to make the fonts bigger so you guys can see it a lot easier. Okay, so now we're going to try to run this Python manage.py run server. And we will go to this URL on our Chrome and see if it uh, shows us something. Okay, cool. So it says install works successfully. Congratulations. And um, believe it or not, this is actually pretty exciting because this is the first um, hint that your app is actually running. Okay. Now to this, we're going to add a lot more features to it and make it really awesome. But right now it's being actually served over your local host and it's running. Okay. And once we get it to a point where it's doing a lot of cool stuff, we'll develop it locally. And then later on, what you can even do is then put it online. So then anybody in the world can use your Django app. Let's go back and let's take a look at what the tutorial is uh, telling us to do at this point. So it says that you should see this stuff and we do. And then it says, ignore the warning about unapplied database migrations for now. We'll deal with the database shortly. Cool. And it says we, you, we've started a Django development server, which is a lightweight web server written purely in Python. We've included this with Django so you can develop things rapidly without having to deal with configuring a production server such as Apache until you're ready for production. Cool. All right. And they say don't use the server in anything resembling a production environment it's intended for developing. Cool. No problem. All right. And uh, now they want us to get started on creating the polls, polls app. Now that your environment, a project is set up, you're set to start doing work. Each application you write in Django consists of a pure or of a Python package that follows a certain convention. Django comes with a utility that automatically generates the basic directory structure of an app. So you can focus on writing code rather than creating directories. Cool. All right, projects versus apps. So what's the difference between a project and an app? Now, the cool thing with Django is that everything is considered an app, okay? So let's say that you create a website that has a blog, that has an e-commerce capability. Now, the blog is considered, a. so let's say you create this website with Django, right? The blog would be considered a Django app and um, your e-commerce store would actually be considered a different Django app. Okay, so there'd be two different apps that your web application is comprised of. That's how Django handles the logic. So basically, it's one project that has multiple apps inside of it. Okay, that's pretty much what they're saying here. Oh, okay, so an app is a web application that does something. Okay, so a web blog system, a database of public records or a simple poll app, a project is a collection of configuration apps for a particular website. A project can contain multiple apps. An app can be in multiple projects. So you can have one app that you build for one project and you can actually have it in different projects that you're doing, which is really cool. Uh, it's like plug and chug. Your apps can live anywhere on your Python path. In this tutorial, we'll, cre we'll create our poll app right next to your manage.py file so that it can be imported as its own top level module rather than a sub module of my site. Okay. To create your app, make sure you're in the same directory as manage.py and type this command. Okay. So now this command python manage.py start app polls, we're going to do that. Okay. So we're going to break our server with control C. Okay. So I did that. I'm going to hit LS and it looks like I'm at the same level as my manage.py file. And if I hit PWD, PWD, It'll show me where I'm at. And now I'm going to do Python manage.py start app. And the app is called polls, I believe. Just let's just double check. Okay. So now our polls app is created. And let's just take a look inside of polls. Polls. Okay. So inside of polls, you can see that we have a bunch of, oh, actually, let's look right over here. It's easier that way. 
So polls comes with migrations, init.py, admin, apps, models, tests, views. There's a lot of things that polls comes up with automatically, which is really nice. But a lot of this stuff is, you know, just kind of empty. Uh, the main things that you're going to be working with is models and views. Okay, that's a, that's the thing you're going to be working with like all the time. When you're developing apps for yourself, later you're also going to be playing around quite, you're going to be do, adding stuff to test to make sure you can test your app as you're building it. And then migrations is going to be important because it's going to kind of let you time travel in your database. So when we keep making changes to your database with migrations, you can like roll forward to a certain time. But let's say like things get really messed up, you can roll back to uh, a previous point in time. All right. So the this directory structure will house the poll application. So this is the directory structure that we actually saw. Okay. And now they want us to write our first view. A view is what lets you go to a specific URL and then it returns some kind of response. Okay. So for example, so Django works off of something called MVT, which is called model view templates. Uh, your normal apps, you know, node.js or whatever, those frameworks work off of MVC, model view controller. So to give you an example of this in real life is when you go to google.com slash, you know, when you go to google.com and you type in like cats, right? Or let's say you go to google.com and you type in whatever, the response that comes to you, right? That maps to the current URL you're at. So how does Google know to show you the Google logo and the Google homepage when you go to google.com, right? So google.com, when you type it in, it sees what your current URL path is, then it goes into the Google code base, and then it finds this HTML file that says, if somebody goes to this path that says google.com, then show them this HTML page that has Google's image on it followed by a search bar and then shows you that, okay? It, so it returns a response. You request something and it returns a response. If you go to apple.com slash watches or watch, I don't know if that's actually a real Apple URL, but like, let's just say you're trying to get an Apple watch. Okay. So if you go to apple.com slash watch, how would it return to you all of their watches, right? So what actually happens is apple.com slash watch will match that path in their code base. And then it'll see if there is, um, a HTML file that corresponds to it. And then it'll show you that HTML file. Okay. As a response. And that's essentially what we're going to do, but we're going to have a very basic version of it. So we're going to go in our polls slash views .py. So I'm in my polls and I'm going to go in my views .py. So when they say it like this, polls slash views .py, that's what they mean. And in here, I'm going to say from Django.http import HTTP response, right? And then I'm going to go here. I'll say define index request. So take in a request and then return an HTTP response. And I will say, hello world. You're at the, let's do it with double quotes because hello world. You're, what is it? At the polls index, right? And then they have a little comma here. This doesn't matter so much. This is just a string, so it doesn't matter what you do. Make sure you always save what you're doing because otherwise it won't take any effect. So make sure you do control S or command S the whole time. So I just created this, but the thing is that it's not gonna show up. So now what I need to do is like tell my app that when somebody goes to the home page, yo, you gotta show this exact this thing right here. Okay. This is the simplest view possible in Django to call the view. We need to map it to a URL. And for this, we need a URL conf for URL configuration to create a URL conf in the polls directory, create a file called urls.py. Your app directory should now look like this. So now notice there's a urls.py here, which was not there before. Okay. 
So we're going to go in our polls, right click here and create a new file and call it urls.py. Okay. And now in our urls.py, we got to add from django.urls import path, from django.urls import path. And then we're going to do from import views. And then we're going to do URL patterns. Uh, so what you want to do is try not to indent, but uh, use four spaces instead. Okay, one, two, three, four, if it doesn't automatically bring you to the right place. All right. And I want to do path. So if somebody goes to the empty path, then I want you to go into our views file and use the index function. And we're going to call give it a name index. Okay. So what does this mean? If somebody goes to, let's say your website is called john.com, right? Somebody goes to john.com followed by nothing else. So not like john.com slash article slash blog, none of that. It's just john.com, your homepage. What happens? Well, then we say, go into the views file and run the index function. So in under views, this is index function. I'll run that. We're naming it index. So then later, if we want to, from our templates or HTML, if we want to refer to this specific URL path, we can just call it by index and it'll uh, reference it. Okay, the next step is to point the root URL configuration at the polls.urls module. Okay, so URL conf, and we got to point it to this. So, all right, in my site slash urls.py, add an import for django.urls include and insert include in the URL patterns list. So you have this. So we're going to go in our my site slash urls right here. And in here, we're going to add the this line, okay? Because we're saying if somebody goes to the path polls, then run the polls uh, URLs. Okay, so from Django contrib import admin, from Django import, from Django.urls import include, comma path, okay? And that's because we're gonna do the include thing right now, just like that. Okay, and then hit save. So if somebody types in john.com slash polls, now we'll say, hey, uh, try to match this pattern by going to the polls.urls file. Well, where is that? That's in the polls app. And it's this file right here. So then it'll go to this file and then it'll match this first guy and it'll say, okay, I'm gonna run the home function, okay? So anytime somebody goes to anything polls, it'll refer it to that file, that URLs file. All right, the, this is what they're basically saying here. The include function allows referencing other URL confs. Whenever Django encounters include, it chops off whatever part of the URL matched up to that point and sends the remaining string to the included URL con for further processing. The idea behind include is to make it easy to plug and play URLs since polls are in their own URL conf they can be placed under or any path and the app will still work. Okay, you have now wired. So now it says you should always include, you should always use include when you include other URL patterns. Okay, and now it says you have now wired an index view into the, let's verify it's working, run the following command. Okay, so now we're gonna run this thing And uh, we'll go to our local host or this HTTP port over here and hit run. And now we are getting an error. Oh yes, basically you have to do slash polls. Okay, of course, um, because it's not a home page thing that we've added it to. Cause I just saw this and I was like, oh, home page but it's because we got to go to the polls path. Okay. So everything after, so it's like, uh, when you put this online, when you put this app online, right, it'll essentially be like your app.com slash polls is where you'll have to go to, and then it'll know what to do. Okay. So it's saying you're at the polls index and that's exactly what we see now. 
cool. Go to this in your browser and you should see the text which you define in the index. The path function is, pa uh, is passed four arguments, two required, route and view, and two optional. At this point, it's worth reviewing what these arguments are for. All right, so we're not gonna go into too much detail. It's gonna be like still casual and we're gonna keep moving forward. we're going to do part two of the official Django tutorial. We have already done quite a bit of stuff, right? We've gotten our local servers started. But what we want to do now is in this video, we're going to actually cover our admin interface and we're going to actually start playing around with it. So it's going to be pretty exciting. I hope you're willing and excited to see how that works. Okay. And we're going to go through this one a little bit faster. So okay. So first thing we want to do is like look at the database setup, which you can frankly ignore if you're new. Uh, but later on, like this is something that you should read. Uh, but for now, we're only going to focus on this command that says Python manage.py migrate. Okay, so this is a complete continuation from the last video. Okay, so make sure you're caught up on everything from part one, I'm going to open up Adam. And I'm going to break out of this by doing control C and I will do Python manage.py migrate and it should give you a bunch of okays. And what that did is created these tables that weren't created before, okay? So they're all created like stuff with usernames and emails and permissions and all the stuff that it has to do on the back end, okay? All right. And um, from here, we're gonna go on and we're gonna try to now create models, all right? so. Well, define your models, essentially your database layout with some additional uh, metadata. How uh, Django models work is their philosophy follows the dry principle, which stands for do not repeat yourself, which is a really common, commonly used acronym in the programming world. And it emphasizes using logic that helps you never really repeat yourself, right? So for example, just to give you a simple example, imagine if you had to print out um, a letter or print out the word boom 100 times. You could keep writing print, boom, print, boom, print, boom, or you could do it in the dry way, which is write a for loop that prints it out 100 times, okay? So that way it allows you to stop yourself from repeating and just helps you do it at once. Now, when you start abstracting it and taking it to a higher level, that might mean taking your code from basic mo basic code and modularizing it into a function or into a class or into a package, things of that nature, okay? And that's the same philosophy Django goes off on. So instead of like repeating yourself over and over again, it lets you create a class, which it then creates models out of and uh, handles a lot of that stuff for you, okay? So we're gonna create this these models, okay? And basically what we're gonna be working on in our simple poll app, we're gonna create two models, question and a choice. A question has a question and a publication date. So almost imagine like a spreadsheet. Let's say you create a new sheet in the spreadsheet and you call the sheet question. You have column one that says question text, column two that has a publication date. So question text on your first row might be, what the hell is going on? and the publication date may be like February, whatever. And your next question might be like, when is Kazi gonna make the next piece of content? Stop making all these crazy videos where he's outside talking to the camera and then your publication date next to it, right? So that's how I want you to picture when we create these models. All right, with that said, let's move on. A choice is gonna be its own spreadsheet or its own sheet, okay? And basically what it does is a choice has two fields, the text of the choice and a vote tally, okay? So the ch text and the vote tally. And then the question that you get to choose is, is actually referenced from the question model. Okay, so let's actually now write this code out. So let's go to our polls and I'm just gonna copy paste it. I recommend that you actually write it out because it's really helpful exercise for you. But just for time, I'm gonna go through it faster. So we're going to put it, I'm going to paste it right here. Okay, and I'm going to save it. All right. Now we have to activate our models. Okay, so I'm going to go into my settings, my site slash settings. 
and inside of here I want to tell Django that we actually have this app installed okay so what I want to do is polls dot apps dot I think it's uh, polls config like that okay and make sure to put a comma after it because after all it is a list with one two three four five six seven elements okay so now Django knows to include the polls app. Let's run another command. So up until now, Django had no idea what this thing that you created, this polls app. But now that you went in my site and added this under settings and added to your installed apps, now it knows that it's actually there, okay? It's the equivalent of kind of like, let's say you downloaded an app on your Mac or your Windows, but you never installed it, right? Like you downloaded a game, but you never installed it. It's kind of like that. So we just installed it by doing this. Okay, and now what we want to do is let's run another command. Python manage.py make migrations polls. Okay, so I'm going to come into my command line. And again, uh, to activate your virtual environment, you'll do source activate followed by the name of your virtual environment. And to deactivate your virtual environment, you will do source deactivate if you're on a Mac. If you're on Windows, then all you need to do is activate, followed by the name of your virtual environment. So in this case, it'll be my site. Okay, so um, since I'm already activated on my virtual environment, I'm just gonna do Python manage.py make migrations polls. And now you see that it says create model choice, create model question, add field question to choice. Okay. All right. By running make migrations, you're telling Django that you've made some changes to your models. In this case, you've made new ones and that you'd like the changes to be stored as a migration. Cool. And this is effectively what the SQL um, will look like for this. So this is not something you have to worry about if you're a beginner and you don't even know what SQL is, totally fine. But if you have a little bit of experience, check it out. What's really cool is like, bunch of this code that you would normally, like generally anything to do with databases requires you to know SQL or write SQL, okay, SQL. And for you to write raw SQL, it looks pretty complicated, right? Like for example, if you go here, there's a lot going on. If you write SQL every day, it may not be that big of a deal, but it's a lot going on. Whereas Django, it's automatically generating all this code for you and you don't even actually even have to worry about it. I just showed it to you so you can see what it actually looks like on the back end. So that's what they're showing here. And we're not just gonna, we're not going to worry about that and since we made the migrations, we're going to commit those migrations to our database by doing python manage.py and typing in migrate, okay? So now it says applying polls initial and it says okay. If I go to my migrations, I can also see this specific migration that I made, okay? And I can read this migration whenever I want. Do not mess around with this file too much unless you know exactly what you're doing. Okay, okay, cool. And now we're gonna play with the API. Uh, another thing about migrations, when you get a little bit more advanced, it allows you to uh, update your database without ever losing track of it. So Flask has kind of a, weird migration thing going on, whereas Django kind of comes with it. And so its database is a lot easier to play around with. Like it says, migrations are very powerful and let you choose your models over time as you develop your project without the need to delete your database or tables and make new ones. That's generally what you have to do um, if you're working with, you know, like just kind of working from scratch. It specializes in upgrading your database live without losing data. So. Again, this is gonna be really powerful and helpful as you get more advanced and as you do more things with models. So now let's play around with the API uh, that actually Django gives to us for free, all right? So we don't actually have to write it, it just kinda of comes with it. So I'm gonna go, and instead of just typing in Python, I'm gonna do Python manage.py shell, okay? And here, I will do from polls.models import question comma choice. And then now we can play around with it. So since we don't have any questions in our system yet, when we actually look up questions and the objects for it, it should show us empty, right? Because we didn't create any 
thing from in the question mo model. Okay, so if I do this dot all, it should show us none. And that's exactly what it's showing us. Like, hey, the query set is actually empty. Now, what we want to do is create a new question. All right. Django expects a time date, use time zone to now instead of this, and it will do the right thing. Okay, so we're going to go from Django dot utils import time zone. Okay, and what does our question take? Remember, if we look in our questions model, it takes two things. It takes a question text and a publication date, and that's what we want to give it to create a new question object. Okay, so pretty much type that in. What is it saying? It's saying, hey, I'm creating a question object. Uh, this question uh, class essentially takes in a few things, question text and publication date. And I'm using keyword arguments. So I'm putting question underscore text equals. So for the question text, it takes in a car field. So let's go actually here in models. And you can see that it takes in a character field right here. And that's why I'm actually passing it in as a string. And then publication date takes in date time field. And that's why I'm passing in the time zone dot now object. Okay. And uh, just going to hit enter here. And now Q is created. So I should be able to do something like, uh, well, let's follow along what their documentation is saying. But if we actually do this now, right? Question dot objects dot all. Let's see if it shows us. So that's because we haven't saved this yet. So once we save it, it's going to show up in our uh, as one of our created objects for a question. So let's follow along. So now it says save the object into the database. You have to call save explicitly. So we're going to do that. I'm going to say q.save. And let's try it again. And now look, it shows us that there is indeed one question. And it even has a number next to it, one. Okay. But it's not very helpful because it's not showing us what that question is, or it's not giving us a very easily readable name when we actually use this API. So I'll show you guys how to overcome that too. All right. So now it has an ID. If you do q.id, it'll show you its ID. It says access model field values uh, via Python attributes. So I could do q.question text. So that question text right there. And it'll show us like what's new and I can do Q dot pub location date and it'll show me the date as a date time object 2018 to which is February 19th. And uh, let's go down here. And we can even change the values by changing the attributes and then calling save on it. OK, so for example, before we had the question as what's new, we can now save that question as what's up. Okay, so for example, I can do Q dot question uh, underscore text is equal to what's up. Okay, is that how? Yep. And uh, I can do Q dot save. And now if I do Q dot question text, you'll see that it actually says what's up, right? displays all the questions in the database. So now if I again do this, which you've seen, it'll show me all of the questions. Right now we only have one question. Okay. So if I wanted to add multiple questions, I could do that. You know, let's say that we add uh, Q2. And then I do Q3. And then I go right over here. Instead of saying what's new, say what's pop in like that, hit enter. And now if I do question dot objects dot all, you can see that it shows me Oh, sorry, I have to save q2 dot save q3 dot save. And now if I do this, you'll see that it shows me I have one question, two questions, three questions. And I can even say for a question in question dot objects dot all I can uh, uh, loop through it print uh, question dot question underscore text like that 
And if I run that, it'll loop through all of these and then it'll print out the question text. Okay, so you can, you can do it. Uh, this is just like playing around with its API and kind of getting comfortable with it, okay? And it goes, wait a minute. Question isn't a helpful representation of this object. So let's fix that by editing the question model in the thing. So that's what I was talking about, right? Like they're saying it in their technical terms. Basically what they're saying is like, hey, look, this looks ugly as hell and doesn't give us any information like what this is about. So let's make it into something that a human can read and be like, oh, okay, I get what this question is and it's readable, right? So that's what we want to do. All we need to do is add a string uh, method, okay? So we're gonna add string representation to it. You'll see what I mean in just a second. So right now it just shows us like blob, like whatever, right? What we're gonna do is under the class question, we're gonna add a um, string method like that, okay? And it's gonna take in self, and then we're gonna say return self.question underscore text, like that, okay? So instead of showing us this, wouldn't it be nicer if it showed us the question? Because that's a much easier way of identifying what that question is when you're just looking at the list. It's just more readable that way, okay? And we're gonna do the same thing with choice. We're just gonna go here, create a function, or create a method, because we're inside of a class. Um, and I will say self, and I'm gonna say return self, uh, self dot, uh, what do I want to do here? Choice underscore text. All right. And I don't think I have to here. Let's try it. Okay, cool. So now it's important to add string methods to your models, not only for your conven own convenience when dealing with the interactive prompt, but also because objects representations are used throughout Django's automatically generated admin. So later when we go and I show you the admin, this is actually gonna be helpful there because then when we're reading these names, um, the admin is gonna be using it. Uh, all the, However, we're showing it in the console right now, it's gonna be showing it on, on our admin interface, right? So like imagine if you created an app and you gave it to your client where it's like a blogging app, right? Or if it's an e-commerce app, you don't want them to go to the store and when they're trying to differentiate between items, it just says item one, item two, item three, item four. It'd be much nicer if it says like bicycle or watch or iPhone X or whatever they're selling, right? It'll be easier for them to identify. That's essentially what we're doing right here. Note that these are normal Python methods. Let's add a custom method just for demonstration. So they're adding a new uh, method here. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna go into my models and uh, we will import date time at the top. And then we're also gonna import time zone, oops, right underneath this guy. Um, and we will add this method under a question, okay? Okay, so was published recently is a method in the question class. So you can do like Q dot was published recently and it'll tell you it, what it's gonna do is gonna basically tell you true or false, okay? So I think what it's checking for is like if it was published within one day or later than 24 hours. Let's see what this say. Note the addition of import and to um, and from Django that is import time zone to reference Python standard date time module and Django's time zone related utilities, respectively. Save these changes and start a new Python interactive shell by running Python manage.py shell again. Now, because we didn't make any changes to the models, we just added new methods we don't have to migrate this to our database. All we need to do is just like exit out of this shell and just like come to it again. So I'm gonna do exit, open, close, paren, and I'm just gonna do python manage.py shell again. And then let's see if we can um, uh, get that command. Yeah, from polls.models. So basically from this file, polls.models, I'm importing this class question and this this model choice, model, both are models, classes, whatever. 
and make sure our string, our uh, addition is working, okay? So now what we're gonna try to do is do the same thing, except this time it's not gonna show us question, whatever, it's gonna actually show us the text of each question. So there you go. What's up, what's new, what's popping, okay? Much easier for us to see this, okay? So again, think of it like if you had a fighter database, instead of it saying fighter one, fighter two, fighter three, it show it to you as like Ken, Ryu, and like Sagat. Django provides a rich database lookup API it's entirely driven by keyword arguments, okay? So you can do something like, hey, I want you to filter by where the ID is one. So it'll give me that specific question only, or I can say filter by ID two, and it's, it'll give me the question that has the ID of two, okay? Or I can filter by question text that says new inside of it, or what's new inside of it. Just like it's showing me here, like if, uh, so let's try this one, okay? So question text starts with what, okay? So let's see. So far, all of these start with a what, so it's gonna show us all three. But what if I do, instead of starts with, I say contains, and I say open, okay? There's only one question that's a, that contains that, okay? Then later we can provide a front end to our client where you can like, in the search bar, type it in, but on the back end, we're using this contains method to uh, find the exact thing that you need and then return it as a response from our HTML file. Get the question that was published this year. Okay, so let's get the question that was published this year. We're gonna do this. We're gonna say current year is time zone dot now dot year. So that's gonna get basically 2018. Right, if I do current year, it'll say 2018. Uh, and question.objects.get, where the publication date year is the current year. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, get return more than one question, it returned three. So because we have um, multiple questions instead of one, Ours is gonna be different than theirs very slightly, okay? So for uh, ours, since it matches all of them, it gets like, yo, what's going on? I'm matching all of them. So, but nothing to worry about. It's still working for us. If you request an ID that doesn't, doesn't exist, it will raise an exception. So for us, we do have ID too, so it won't raise an exception. But like, let's say that we try to find something with an ID of four or five, uh, sorry, we have to do dot get. It's gonna raise an exception, okay? Um, also for this, let's try, so what would happen if instead of dot get we use filter? Would we get an error or would we get something in return? We would get something in return which is like all of these that match it, okay? So the dif difference between filter is like return everything that matches and get is like get one. And if more than one match, then like throw an error or something like that. Okay, so look up by a primary key is the most common use case. So Django provides a shortcut for a primary key lookup. So following question, the following is identical to questions that objects that get ID. So PK, which is a primary key. Okay, so every model uh, will have a primary key. So for example, question will have a primary key, choice will have a primary key. And the thing about this is like, let's say you have a database with people in it, right? Or employee names. Well, what if you have two John Smith employees, right? Out of a hundred employees, or what if you have two Apple watches in your e-commerce store that you're selling that have the same name or two people that have the same name? How are you going to differentiate what if they have the same email address or whatever, right? So you need one thing that's always, 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 always unique. So if you can't rely on their first name, last name, or email address or whatever else, one thing you can always rely on is a primary key. It could be an automatically generated key uh, from Python, and it could be like random words or whatever, right? Django will handle the primary keys for you. Everything will have a primary key, even if it doesn't show it to you on the back end. This way, you can always find, um, you know, the unique way of referring to something. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so let's go here saying that make sure our custom method worked. So it says Q that object I get PK one. Okay. So basically what I'm going to do is go here and say, Hey, get me the object where the primary key is one and save it as Q. And now I'm going to ask if Q was published recently. Okay. And it says true. Okay, cool. So that's the result we got. Give the question question a couple of choices. The create call constructs a new choice object, does insert statement, adds the choices, set available choice, and returns the new choice object. Django creates a set to hold the other side of a foreign key relation. Questions from which can be accessed via the API. All right, so we're gonna do this guy again. Um, if you haven't done so already. Display any choices from the related object set. So we don't have any choices so far, okay? We're right now basically voting for questions, kind of like you can upvote uh, comments on YouTube. So now we're gonna create three choices. So create. So we're gonna take a question, which is our first question, which was like, what's up? And um, we're gonna create choice text is equal to not much with zero votes. Okay, and you can see choice has a field called votes and then it has choice text. So our first answer to that question, what's up, it is not much, but we're saying like, look, it only has zero votes, okay. Okay, and now we're gonna create another choice, but uh, call the sky, what's up, the sky. I mean, I guess that's kind of funny. I say the ceiling. Um, and then here's another one that is, and we're gonna st store this one actually, SC, oh, okay. There we go. Okay, so now choice objects have API access to their related question objects. Okay, so now if I do C dot question, so even though I've created this model from choice, you know, you'd be looking at it be like, hey, how does it have access to the specific question? Like, how did it access this field? How, here's how I did it because we're saying in this question, go to the foreign key, and the foreign key is this model over here. When I do choice.question, it'll go and get the question from up there. That's essentially what it's doing, okay? So that's what, when I do c.question, that's what's happening. It's referencing and getting me back this object. Okay, and vice versa. So you can also reference from question, you could reference choice. Question objects get access to choice objects, okay? So they both have access to each other. Kind of like you can have a book and, you know, like who was the author of this book? So that relation goes to the author. And then you can say like this author has which books and it can relate back to the books. All right, so now we're going to see uh, how many choices we have. And so we have not much is one choice. The other one we have is the sky. And then the other choice that we have is just hacking again. All of these have zero votes as we see right here. And we're gonna say q.choice underscore set dot count. So this is just to count that there are actually three choices. The API automatically follows relationships as far as you need. Use double underscores to separate relationships. This works as many levels deep as you want. There's no limit. Find all choices for any questions whose publication date is in this year, reusing the current year variable we created above, okay? So I can say choice.objects.filter, question, uh, double underscore means like you are kind of going backwards. So we're saying, question and then we're going publication date. OK, 
Okay, so actually we're going this question here and then we're going publication date and then checking the year, getting the year of that publication date. Okay, so let's try that right over here. So it's going to get us all the questions that are from this current year. So it should get us all three of these. Let's delete one of the choices, use delete for that. So now what I can say is I can get the question that starts with just hacking, right? And how do I do that? I say q.choiceset.filter by where choice text starts with just hacking, okay? So it's only gonna get one question that has just hacking in there. And if I do C, it'll show you which one it is. And now to delete it, all I do is c.delete. Again, I'm copy pasting, copying and pasting for time purposes, uh, saving time, but for yourself, like take the time to actually write all of this out, okay? This is very, very helpful for you. So now that I deleted it, it showed me that it's deleted, and if we actually check again, right, it'll only show us these two choices right here. Okay. Now we're gonna get into a pretty exciting part, which is introducing the Django admin, and we're actually gonna just touch on it a little bit, um, and let's get started. This is a super cool part. Philosophy, so generating admin sites for your staff or clients to add, change, and delete content is tedious work that doesn't require much creativity, okay? It's usually like a pretty rinse and repeat process. It's frustrating, it's boring. Um, you can make mistakes. It takes a lot of time and development, which means like it'll cost your client a lot and uh, it slows down your development speed. For that reason, Django entirely automates creation of admin interfaces for models. Okay, so let's check it out. The admin isn't intended, intended to be used by site visitors, it's for site managers, okay? So now we're gonna create an admin user. I'm gonna do python manage.py create. So we're gonna exit out of this. I'm gonna do python manage.py create super user. And I'll leave this blank. I'll use this email. And even though it's not gonna uh, show you anything here, it's still typing in your password. So don't worry about that. Okay, so you can put in whatever as your email, whatever as your username. And now the final step is to answer your, enter your password. I have. And now it says start the development server. So we're gonna do just that. I'm gonna start the development server. We're gonna go to Chrome. We're gonna go to our local app on 127.0.01 colon uh, 8000 port. And instead of polls, I'm actually gonna go to admin. And when I go to admin, look, it brought up this nice interface that you and I did not make. We didn't make this beautiful looking form where when you hover over login, it like turns dark and looks good. And um, we didn't add functionality that adds security, right? Um, we didn't add this thing where passwords automatically looks like dots so nobody can see it. All of this, keep in mind, is just automatically generated. When I click login, boom, here's the administrator interface, okay? so. As the admin, you can change your password, you can log out, you can check who are the users. So here's one user. You can like go into this user and like delete this user or uh, change the permissions of this user, right? So you can go and be like, boom, it's not a super user anymore or he's not a staff anymore, it's not active anymore. Or you can go in here and like change all kinds of permissions, like can delete choice, can add a question, but cannot like delete a question, can change a session, but cannot delete a, a content type, you know? You can get like as specific with it as you want. 
Um, and this is just for the model that we have registered, you know, users. But imagine later when, if we register our choice model and whatever, those will all show up right over here. And any recent actions that you do actually show up on the right hand side. So imagine like somebody deleted something, you're like, what the hell happened? Like one part of our app or this website is now broken. Well, if you go into recent actions, you'll see what took place and exactly who did it and who to hold responsible for that. I think that's pretty cool, right? And it comes built in right out of the gate. That's one of the reasons why Django is such a powerful tool and it fosters productivity and effectiveness, I believe, over any other framework, right? And their tagline, which is awesome, it's uh, Django is for perfectionists with deadlines. And that's what I believe in too. Like if I have to put a project together and I'm doing something solo, I'm going Django all day, baby. But you know, if you're working on some long term project, you know, you're going to be doing for a long time and nothing else really matters, then yeah, you can choose whatever you want. But I like speed. I like productivity. I like to take my ideas from my head and launch them online fast. All right, with that said, let's go back and see what they're saying. So we go to our admin, enter the admin site, and now it says make the poll app modifiable in the admin. How do we do that? We're gonna take these three lines of code. So I'm gonna go into my poll slash admin. And uh, this line is already added, so I'm not gonna add it in. From dot models import question. Okay, so Basically, what I'm saying is from this directory, get the models. So right here uh, and import the class question from the models. OK, so import the question model. And then I'm going to say um, register that model inside of admin. So check out what happens. OK, this is super, super cool. Check it out. I'm going to hit save and um, Let's go back to our app and let's hit refresh and look at that. It's here. So that questions model is the one we made. It shows under polls, questions, and you can see all of those questions. What's popping? What's new? You can go in and you can change the text. So I can change it to like what's cracking, right? I can hit save and now it's changed. And if I go to my if I start Python manage.py shell from polls uh, dot models import question question dot objects dot all right look it says what's cracking so what we actually changed from the GUI interface with our mouse and our keyboard is now showing up in our database, in our local database, the SQLite database that's actually being stored on our computer. This database is not online yet. So pretty freaking cool, right? How quickly and how effectively it works. So I'm gonna exit out of this. I'm gonna run my server again. And we're gonna go back to the app, refresh, cool. And like, let's see what they're saying. Now that we have registered question, Django knows that it should be dis displayed on the admin index page, and it is, right? And I showed it to you. And we went inside of it, and we saw question text, and we saw a date published, and we can actually change the date published and everything. Now, things to note here, the form is automatically generated from the question model. So this form is automatically generated. We didn't need to generate anything. The different model field types, date time field and car field. So Remember, we had one of the models as a date time field and the other one is car field. And you can see where it says date published, look, date field, right? And for question text, it's just a straight up character field or what you know in Python to be as um, a string. These correspond to the appropriate HTML input widget. Each type of field knows how to display itself in the Django admin. Pretty cool. Each daytime field gets free JavaScript shortcuts. Woohoo! Free JavaScript shortcuts. That's awesome. So normally you'd have to write JavaScript for all this stuff, but like look at this. Okay, so let's say I go to what's cracking and I click here. Boom. Look at this. Beautiful daytime picker thing opens up. And you could pick today, or you could pick another date and it'll like automatically pick it. And you could pick the time. 
and that's cool. This is this is something you'd have to write a lot of manual JavaScript for that's automatically written for you. Uh, dates get a today shortcut and calendar pop-up and times get a now shortcut and convenient pop-up that lists commonly entered times. The bottom part of the page gives you a couple of options, right? So save, saves, changes, and returns to the change list page for this type of object. So you can do save or you can do save and continue editing. So continue editing the same page or you can do save and add another. So add a new question and go, right? Or you can do delete, which displays a delete confirmation page. So check this out, okay? Normally when you hit, you have to add all this functionality. Plus when you hit delete, you have to then remember to add a confirmation thing to it and they have it automatically. So if I hit delete, it'll be like, are you sure you want to delete the question? What's cracking? All of the following related items will be de deleted. Questions one, so only one question and objects, what's cracking? You can say, yes, I'm sure, or no, take me back. Now notice, it's showing the question as what's cracking. That's because of your string method that you added, your str method. If you did not have that, it would not show like what's cracking. It would show like question one, and you would just have to use your memory to remember that. I'm gonna say, no, take me back, and it'll take me back, okay? Cool. Uh, let's go back, let's see what they're saying here. And then if the value of the date published doesn't match the time you created, it probably means you forgot to set the time. Uh, we can also set the current time zone, right? So it's not a big deal. If I go into history here, uh, it says I changed it at 3 a.m. It's not 3 a.m. right now. So that means like I need to go inside of my settings and in my time zone and change uh, what my time zone is. So for example, I think there's like, um, America slash Los Angeles, something like that. Um, oh, it actually worked, sweet. Uh, for yourself, just look up like time zone, uh, Django time zone settings, and then find yours and put that in. For me, I put this in and it fixed my time instantly, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, essentially that's it for part two. We're going to jump into part three and uh, we're going to get started. So um, if you haven't already, open up Atom. Go to where you created your My Site project, right? For me, it was in GitHub, My Site. I'm going to click open and I'm going to say whatever, open and recover state. Cool. And uh, here it is. And then if I do Command Shift P and type in terminal, my terminal pops up. Bada bam. And also make sure to do source activate my site. And we are good. Okay. So writing your first Django app part three. So what they're talking about here is they're saying, okay, like, look, you have um, every, everything in Django is essentially called a view. Okay. So for example, if you have a blog home page, that's a view. If you have the ability to comment, like a comment action, right? That's considered a view. If you click on a blog post and it shows you its details, we refer to that as a detail page, but that's still part of the view. That's essentially what they're saying right over here. Another example of this is like, let's say I take you to Instagram. So let's say I click on Clever Kazi, right? This is essentially for Instagram. And let me just plug my Instagram here too. Go follow me if you aren't already because awesome. And uh, if you go here, right, like, look, this is the home page for all my posts. Okay, this would be considered the home page view. If I click into it, that's considered a detail view because it's only showing that one particular post. Okay. If I click here, that's a comment action, which is, you know, you can work that into the views. So just wanted to show you that. So you understand where all of this is coming from. Now we come over here and that's now they're saying that in our poll application, we're essentially going to have a index page in our views. So this is going to display the latest few questions. We're going to have a detail page, which is going to display a text with no results, but with a form to vote. So when you click, so like you come in, you have a bunch of questions, you click on a question and then boom, it has like ability to vote it up and down. Okay. I assume. And uh, we have a question results page. So it's gonna display the result for a particular question. How did that question do? How many votes it got? 
And then we have vote action. So handles voting for a particular choice in a particular question. Okay, cool. All right, so now we kind of know that we're gonna be creating like these things, okay? Uh, we're gonna be creating an index, homepage, a detail, and results. And also what they're saying over on this part is it's saying like, hey man, have you ever seen really ugly URLs like this? Well, don't worry because in Django, you can make them really beautiful. So you can have them like this instead, like johnsmith.com slash news archive slash 2018 slash two or slash February, whatever. And you can make them look really nice. How does it work? It works off of URL confs or your URL configuration mapping, okay? So you map URL patterns to views. So somebody goes to this URL, it knows which view to run. All right, so now we're gonna write more views, okay? So we're gonna write these guys here. Again, I'm just gonna copy it and talk about it. For you, I encourage you to type it all out and walk through it, okay? I'm just gonna highlight the main part. So I'm gonna go in my poll slash views.py. So in polls, I'm gonna go inside of views, or actually we're gonna leave the index for now. Paste it here, okay. So now we got detail, we got results, and we got vote. De everything always takes in a request object, okay? A request is passed whenever you do anything. Um, I'm not gonna touch on it too much right now, but this is a first parameter you kind of always put in. And then as your second parameter, we're putting in the specific question ID. This way we can look up that particular question from the database. So let's say you wanted to look up a, a blog post, right? So you have multiple blog posts. You wanna be able to look up a specific one. Well, we're gonna use ID for that. And in this case, our ID is our primary key and that will allow us to look up that unique thing. Or in Instagram's case, it allowed us to look up that unique post. Okay, cool. Now what we wanna do is wire these new views into the polls.urls module by adding the following path calls, okay? So that's what it's showing here. I'm gonna, co I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it into our poll slash urls.py. I'm gonna go and slash urls and paste it here. All right, so what does this mean? If you just go to slash polls, right? So johnsmith.com slash polls, it's gonna run this thing. It's gonna match the empty pattern after polls um, and then it's gonna run the views.index function, okay? If you go to poll slash, if you wanna go to something like poll slash five or Instagram post slash whatever your post is, right? If you wanna be able to do that, you want a pattern that can match that, okay? So if I put in 20, it shouldn't break. If I put in eight, it shouldn't break. It should always be matched. And so how we can do that is we basically do this thing with angle brackets and do int colon question underscore ID. And this can dynamically match whatever pattern you put in. And another beautiful thing, you guys, usually for URL mapping, you have to deal with ugly regular expressions, except for the latest Django, you don't have to worry about regular expressions anymore. So for example, let's say you wanted to match this particular pattern. Well, you can put this in, and if somebody puts in a five here, right, it'll automatically know that it's an integer and work. If they put in something else, it might freak out, okay? So it's really smart. And then it says, hey, if somebody goes to a URL like this, automatically takes them to the detail view. And if somebody goes to a URL that ends in a results like this, then, um, which is essentially what you're saying here, hey, any number followed by results, take them to the results one, and any number followed by the word vote, take them to the vote view. Cool? And uh, let's see what happens. So I'm gonna run, I'm gonna do Python, manage.py run server. Cool, and I will open up my Chrome, and we will go to this guy over here. Okay, so now we're getting an error is because we actually have to go to that particular URL. So in this case, let's go to slash polls and it should run our index function. So I'm gonna do slash polls. Boom, it ran our index function. What does our index function say? Let's go to our views. And that's what it says. Hello world, you're at the polls index, perfect. Well, what if somebody goes to poll slash five or poll slash 193, what happens then? 
it'll take us to the detail function. And what does the detail function say? It says you're looking at question number with the question ID. Cool. So let's try and let's see what happens. I'm going to do 193. Okay. So the cool thing here that's happening is that you're able to take what's in the URL and you're able to pass it down to your HTML. So right here, that 193, right? If I make it like some other crazy number, it'll pass that down here, right? So now we're able to actually take in arguments from our URL and use them in our code. What if I said something like this? It'll say, hey, that pattern actually is not matched. So that's exactly what we wanted. If you don't put in a number here, it should automatically detect it. Now, if you wanna go to something like slash poll, slash a number, slash results, what do you do? Okay, so let's say I have this number and I go to results, just like that. And now it should say something like, you're looking at the results of question followed by whatever it is, okay? So you're looking at the results of question that, right? Or a question two. And then if you go and try to do this thing with vote, you're gonna get the same thing. So if I go to my URLs, it says, hey, go to slash poll slash number slash vote. So we're gonna do slash poll slash number slash vote. I'm gonna hit enter and it says you're voting on question two. Perfect, that's exactly what we should be getting here and it's looking great. All right, so it's saying, hey, look, take a look at this in your browser and it'll display the placeholders and that's exactly what it did. And how does it work? Well, uh, detail, our function that we have, uh, will take in a request object followed by the question ID. So when we pass in the question ID to be 193, right? This part became 193. And this part is just that request object. So what they have here. Again, if you're confused about objects and what the hell's going on, it's not completely necessary, but you should look at some object oriented programming stuff. Okay. And I do have a course on object oriented programming and you could comment on it if you're interested. All right, so the question ID is equal to 34 comes from this thing, and I've explained that to you already. When you put that in the URL, uh, this dynamically actually pulls it out. And once it dynamically pulls it out, because you see it says, here it says question ID, question ID. That's where it's actually pulling it from, okay? And um, that's essentially it. And then it says, hey, you don't need to do ugly things like latest.html because it's not necessary and it's apparently silly, okay? So don't do it. And you should write views that actually do something. And here they're saying, hey, look, each view is responsible for doing one of two things. Either it should return what it's supposed to return or give you like a 404, and then the rest is up to you. So, you know, basically you can have a view, or it can read records from a database, so meaning reading records reading posts from a database, so Instagram posts, Facebook posts, or it can generate PDF files or output XML or create a zip file on the fly, anything you want, and pretty much using whatever Python libraries you want because Django is 100% Python, so you have full Python power. And then all Django wants is that HTTP response, okay? So you can't return it as a string, you can't return it, you have to return it as some kind of an HTTP response or throw an exception, okay? So now here's what they're doing. They're like, all right, we're gonna do something cool. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take like all of the questions you have, we're gonna order it by the publication date and then show the top five most recent ones, okay? How are they doing that? Well, I'm gonna copy this and then we're gonna play around with it, okay? So we're gonna go back to our thing and what do they have here? From dot models import questions and they're in our poll slash views. Okay, so this is one thing that we need to do from dot models import question because we don't have that. So we're gonna paste it in here and then they want us to redefine our index okay so we're gonna do just that i'm gonna change my definition of what my index function is all right so how is this working well question dot question dot objects that order by 
And what this thing does is it'll take all your questions and order it by something. So in our models, if you look, we have this thing publication date. So pub underscore date. So we're going to order it by publication date. Now, what we're doing with this minus sign is we're saying in the reverse order, okay? So instead of the oldest um, publication date and showing us in the oldest way, we wanted to show it in a descending order. So we wanted to show us the recent ones first. And then what we're doing is that we're just, and so this will return to us a list, okay? And then you can index a list in Python by doing this, and we're just saying give us the first five. So from zero, uh, up to but not including five. So zero, one, two, three, four. That's five. Okay. And then as output, we're saying, hey, uh, join all of them, all of the questions by a comma. Okay. So if you want to know a little bit more about like how the Python is working in there. So here we're doing um, a list comprehension. And uh, you can read more about list comprehensions if you don't know what that is. It's not too important. And it's just a cool way of, of writing this, you know, instead of multiple lines, you just write in one line. And we're just saying, uh, for each question, give us its text. That's all we're saying. And then we're saying, join it all by commas. So that's how it's going to output it. So it's going to return to us um, pretty much a string, okay? And then we want to return that, okay? Uh, as our output. So we're just going to do HTTP response output. That's it. So now let's take a look at it. So I'm going to save it and we're going to go to our thing and uh, we'll try to go to our index. And where's our index? It's just that slash polls. Okay. That should trigger our index. And let's see what happens. So I hit enter and it shows me all my questions. So if you remember, I created three questions. What's cracking? what's new, what's up, and it's showing us with separated by a comma. I could do show it to us separated by three stars. If I refresh, it separates it by three stars. You could separate it by an image, whatever you want. You know, this is just pure Python. Okay, so that's essentially it, but there's something wrong here, and the thing that's actually wrong here is like, Look, you're not going to have your toilet and your refrigerator in the same room, right? You're muddying the water. Just like that, you don't want to have your HTML code and your Python in the same place. We want to kind of separate it out. So right now, the design of our page is in the same place that handles our logic, okay? So what we want to do is handle our logic by pure Python in one place and all our HTML and the design of the page should be outside of this logic, okay? So we wanna create something for that. So what we're gonna do, and what this tutorial tells us to do, is inside polls, you wanna create a new folder, and you wanna call this folder templates. This is important. The case sensitivity of this is important, as well as the name. So if you mess up the name or you put a typo, you're gonna kind of get messed up here. Also, Pay attention to the order of all this, okay? So under my site, so under polls, you're gonna have templates. And then inside of templates, you wanna create a new folder and you wanna call it polls, all right? And inside of this is where you're gonna throw all your HTML files. So we're gonna create, we're gonna create a new file in here and we're gonna call it index.html, okay? So just in slow motion for you, polls, templates, polls, index, okay? So essentially it's like polls, templates, polls, index, like that. All right, let's go back to our tutorial. And that's what it's saying. It's saying that, hey, Django will automatically look for it and find these templates and uh, essentially to Django, the path will look like polls slash index.html because of how Django uh, works and looks for these. And you can override it and do all kinds of advanced stuff, you know, if you wanna read more into that. We're gonna just uh, kinda keep it a little bit basic so everybody can follow. All right, and now we're gonna put the following code into, um, into that template. So it's telling us which file to put that code in. So I'm just gonna hit this button, copy this code, and uh, we're gonna go into our index.html and I will paste it right over here, okay? What is this code saying? It's saying, hey, if there are any questions, 
then I want you to create an unordered list. Okay, that's what a UL tag is in HTML. And then what I want you to say is for a question, and so for any questions, I want you to put it as like a bullet point and show that question, okay? Uh, and link to that particular question. Otherwise, say that there are no polls available. So if we didn't have any questions at all, it'll say no polls available, and then end the if statement, okay? So we're starting our for loop here, we're ending it here, we start our if statement here, and then we have our else statement here, and we have our end if here. All right, so that's cool. Now we wanna make sure that we actually link to this index uh, a.html file. How are we gonna do that? Here's how. Now let's update our index view in post slash views at py to use the template, okay? So we're gonna do just that. And also let's update our index function just a little bit. So here's a few lines that we're adding. Let's go back to our views and uh, we will, so latest question, we'll keep that and we'll just paste this in here. All right, save. So what's going on? We're still getting those re most recent five questions, but uh, that's what la latest question list is gonna become. And if you don't have five questions, they'll pick the top three or top uh, or the re recent most four, okay? Something like that. And then what we're doing is we're loading that template, poll slash index.html, okay? So we're using loader. Um, and then there's something called context dictionary in Django. And what you can do is you can pass from the back end server side, pass this to your front end, so your HTML code. It'll know about it, okay? So if I go back to our templates, my index.html, how is it getting access to this variable latest question list? Well, we're actually passing it in our context. All right, that's, that's what's going on. And then we're saying, as HTTP response, template.render, we're saying, hey, um, send that context with that request and send it over to the HTML file. So it sends all that over to the HTML file and then our HTML file has access to that latest question, okay? And this weird stuff you're seeing here with this, with a percent sign squiggly bracket, that's Django templating uh, engine, okay? So it's basically HTML with a little Django pizzazz. Cool. And so now they're like, hey, this is such a common step to load a template and then to do template.render that they're, they made a shortcut for it, which is just render. So how can you use that? Like this, okay? So basically, you can remove this line. You don't need this line anymore. And thanks to this line at the top from Django.shortcuts import render, which you should have, we're gonna use this render. And how are we gonna do it? We can just replace all of this, and we can say render. The first argument is request, okay? And then after that, the path to that index file. So polls slash index.html, just like that, followed by the context dictionary. So in this case, we're just calling it context, okay? Sometimes what I like to call this is stuff for uh, front end, all right? Just to keep it consistent. And just so you know, the thing that you're accessing on the back end is not this guy, it's the dictionary, context dictionary key. So it's actually this string, all right? And that's what will give you back this guy. Okay, so note that once we've done all this in views, we no longer need to import loader, blah, blah, blah. Exactly, that's what we did. And now they're gonna show us how to raise a 404 error, all right? So what happens if it doesn't exist? So let's tackle the question detail view. The page that displays the question text for a given poll, here's the view. So in poll slash views at py, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, from django.http import HTTP 404. So since we're already using django.http to import HTTP response, we're also gonna say HTTP 404. Okay, just like that, we're gonna save it. And then we're gonna come back and now it wants us to make changes to our detail view. And it's saying, hey, turn it into this. So let's turn it into that. 
and I'm gonna save it. So uh, try accept blocks, all it does is if there's an error, try accept blocks will catch it, okay? Try accept block it is pretty much the same thing as a if then condition, except that if you're running into some kind of crazy error, try accept blocks will catch it and still run. For example, if you divided a number by zero in Python, your code will just freaking crash, right? It'll give you this red blob, your app will crash, whatever you're doing. But if you run a try accept block that says, if you get a zero division error, then just pass, you'll not get that error, it'll just pass it. Okay, so what we're saying is we're saying try to get that particular, that one specific question, okay? So we're saying we're getting that question ID and we're saying get that object that has that primary key or that question ID or where that primary key is equal to the question ID. So if I pass in a URL like um, app.com slash polls slash six, right? What it's gonna do, or let's say slash two, what it'll do is pass this two in to here, that this will become two, and the question will get the question object that has an ID of two. In this case, it might be one of my questions that, that I think is what's new right, my what's new question. So then this question will become the what's new question object. And um, then what we do is that we just return that, okay? And we pass it in our context dictionary and we pass that question in here. Except if the question does not exist, then we raise HTTP4 and we say question does not exist, okay? Cool. Let me make sure to delete that. That's not supposed to be there. I just added that to show you guys what's up. Okay, uh, the new concept here, the view raises, yep. We'll discuss what you could put in that poll slash detail.html template a bit later, but if you'd like to quickly get the above example working, a file containing just this. Um, okay, so we're gonna get that thing working, okay? So in here, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call it a uh, detail.html and in detail we're just gonna put question just like that okay so now we got to make it work and we're gonna go and get our question too okay so because that specific question exists look it says what's new now if I change this ID to one it's gonna get the question that was what's up if I change it to three it's gonna be the what's cracking but what happens if I change it to four Remember, I only created three questions. If I change it to four, it says page not found. And look, the error it throws up is question does not exist. Now, if we didn't have that, right? If we actually don't have that. So let's go back to our views and um, I'll just remove this and I'll just say, instead of raise, I'll just say pass, okay? Pass is the equivalent of saying ignore to Python. Let's go back, let's refresh. We're gonna get this ugly error, which we don't actually know what to do with or what it means, and it is very confusing. But when we have this, when we raise this thing, and I refresh, you see it says question does not exist. So it's a lot easier for us to see what the problem is. And because we know it's coming from here, then we can like start debugging and know what's going on. Okay, so that's why that particular thing is important. All right, let's move on along. All right, so a shortcut. So instead of having this try accept thing on raise, we can actually do a cute shortcut that says get object or 404. And that's a method that's in, Py uh, in Django, it comes with it. So we'll throw that and it's in our shortcuts. So from Django.shortcuts import render and actually import get object or 404, okay? And just to stay consistent with them, we'll do it in this because starts with the G and starts with R, so alphabetical orders and pep eight and, okay. All right, so we're gonna go here. We will go to where it says question in detail and we're gonna remove this whole thing, okay? Make our life easier. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna say, ba bam, right? We're gonna say, hey, Get object or 404. So that particular question with the primary key of this, if it doesn't exist, then it'll automatically say it doesn't exist. 
and then pretty much the last line will keep it what it was. We'll save this. And basically as our context dictionary, we're saying pass the question as a question. Okay, so there are three arguments in here. Request, the HTML, pass the HTML file as a string, and then a dictionary. So then we can use it on our back end. Uh, again, in our detail HTML, we can actually use, we can see that question. Save. And now let's try to go to it again. So I'll say four. And now look, it says no question, no question matches the given query question as in like no question object. Okay. But if I do three, it finds us and takes us to it. So this is what we mean. This is what I mean when I say Python is really, uh, Django is really awesome. It comes with a lot of intelligent defaults. Whereas you don't have to write a lot, of, a lot of this code, right? It works on that dry principle. Do not repeat yourself. And a lot of these things just come built in out of the box and it, it speeds up your development time, saves you a lot of those new code lines because every new code line that you write, there's an additional chance for an error. So the amount of code lines that you can reduce, the less errors you will make. Plus your code just looks beautiful and so much more readable, right? Get object or 404 instead of try da 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 da, da except object dot does not exist, right? So it's confusing. Okay, let's go on. Get object or 404. This is some advanced stuff. We're gonna skip that for now. Now it says use the template system. So in our detail.html, we're gonna go and I'm gonna paste that there, save it, and uh, let's see what it's saying. Back to the detail view for our poll application. Here's what it should look like. Okay, so now let's go to the detail and let's see. First, let's just see what the result is, right? And then we'll talk about it. I'll hit enter. What's cracking? It's showing it to me in a nicer way. Let's do two. It's showing it to me in a nicer way. What happens if I do four? Same thing. No question matches the given query. Okay, so what are they doing here? They take your particular question and they wrap it up in a H1 tag in HTML. Anything that's an H1 tag will make, it's called heading one. And you can go all the way down to heading six, heading six being the smallest, heading one being the biggest, boldest. So we have it in heading one. And then right underneath it, we say for choice in question uh, dot choice underscore set dot all. So for all of the choices, as like at choices as in the particular answers you can have to each question, right? Those, those answers are the ones that actually get an upvote or uh, there's no downvote, so an upvote. Show me all of those answers, except in this case, we don't have um, any answers or any choices. So that's why it's not showing those. How is it working? The template system uses dot lookup syntax. So you'll do question dot question text. So it'll go into the question and then it'll access the question underscore text. Another thing to notice if you're more advanced, if the question underscore text attribute did not exist, it would go and try to access it as a list index. Okay, so imagine if it was like if you did question dot zero or something like that. So you, you're still using dot notation. So that's something that could trip you up later. Okay, uh, it would have tried a list index lookup. Okay. And then um, method calling happens in the for loop. So this for loop method calling is happening there because you know, you're doing question dot choice underscore set dot all. Okay. Um, and then it's interpreted as Python code, which is cool, like right here. And it returns an iterable of choice objects. And then we iterate over it, right? So that's why we use a for loop and then we iterate over it. Now, Remember when we wrote the link to a question, the poll slash index.html. So let's go to our poll slash index.html. You can see what we did here, right? So we said slash. So for the links, we said slash polls slash this, right? So let's go take a look at this page one more time. We're going to go right here and I'm just going to hit polls and hit enter. So you can see how it's showing me what's cracking, what's new, what's up. So each of this, and when you click into it, you go into its detail view, right? Kind of like when you click into a blog post. 
And also under what's up, you can actually see the choices. So that's just the recent thing we just added. Right? So how is that working? How are we linking it? And how we're linking it, we're saying slash polls slash that question ID, which matches one of the paths in our URLs.py. So if I take you to my URLs, it'll match the path of this guy. And that takes you to the detail view. And that's how we can see the detail view. So let's go back. But we're hardwiring the URL paths. This way, if we have a lot of URL paths, our logic can get messed up. Or if we change, if we go in our URLs.py and I, I don't know, change this path to be something else, right? It has like, uh, it says polls here, again, followed by something else. It could like mess us up. So what we want to do is we want to use it in a dynamic way. So that's what they're showing us here. So they're saying, hey, replace this guy with this guy. So we're going to do just that. Okay, so we're going to go back to our index.html and we will just do this. Okay. So now what this is saying is for the URL, use detail, detail as in this, that's where we're getting the name from. And then as the argument, pass in the question dot ID. So this question, since we're looping over it, if you do question dot use a dot notation, it'll get you that particular questions ID. So question dot ID, that's what you pass in as the argument. And so then when you go to your URLs to this question ID, that's what it's going to pass. Okay, that's essentially it. And I believe you should also be able to do question underscore ID equals uh, that but in this case we're just going to keep it like this okay so no need for um keyword arguments okay and then in in between here so that's what it's going to link to it's going to link to the detail view of that particular question and the text that we're generating is just from uh right here so that's question dot question underscore text if you are confused by this look up stuff on HTML, okay, and look up how links work in HTML. Again, I'm not going to go into too much HTML because that's outside the scope of this tutorial. Okay. okay, and that's how it's essentially working. Now, namespacing URL names, it's basically just telling us like, hey, look, so let's go down over here. Uh, let's just make sure we're not missing anything, okay, from the top. Okay, so they're saying if you want to change the URL to something else, perhaps to something like poll slash specific slash 12. So this is something that I've already said, but but they're just reiterating here and they're saying, hey, like if you change the URL, it's still gonna work now that we change it to be the dynamic way, okay? So now we can change our URL pattern to whatever. Uh, and it's not hardwired anymore. And uh, now they're talking about namespacing URL names, okay? So this way you want to make sure that all of your apps actually have, there's no way for like right now we only have the polls app, right? But what if we wanted to have more apps inside of this, then what could happen is that if any of our HTML files name matched, so let's say you have a polls app and it has an index.html file, right? What if you had a blog app and that also had an index.html file? Now you're going to have a collision. So what we do for that, that's a, that's a reason why we create under templates, another folder called polls. And if we wanted to add templates for our blogging app, that's why we would have an app called blog. And then under that we'd have templates. And then under that we'd have blog. And then under that uh, would put our HTML stuff. Okay. That's the reason why we do it like that. And this way there's going to be no collisions. Okay. Now change your poll slash index.html. So let's see what it's saying here. So we can have our app name, app underscore name, um, app underscore name is equal to poll. So this is in our URLs.py. So let's go right there, URLs.py. And they're saying, hey, add that guy right over here. Okay. 
and pretty much everything else we want to just leave as is. Now change your poll slash index.html template from this to this. So in our index.html, we're going to go right here and we're going to paste that guy. So notice the difference. All we did is we do polls equals de uh, polls colon detail. Okay. That's really the only difference. There's no other difference. I'm going to save that. And this way, our URLs will never collide and everything has a proper uh, name spacing, right? Because right now we created a detail for our polls. What if you want to create, um, if, what if you had an add a new app called blog and then create details in there? You don't want it to just be called detail because it's going to collide with the polls detail. But now because it's polls colon detail, then later you could do blog colon detail or Instagram post colon detail or Facebook status colon detail. And this way you can differentiate all of those different apps you have within one of your Django projects. Okay. Writing your first Django app part four. All right. So we're continuing the web poll application and we'll focus on simple processing, simple form processing and cutting down our code. So the big things we're going to be doing is how do you add a form that where you can submit information to. So basically it's going to be a, a form. It's going to have radio buttons. You're going to pick your choice. You're going to click on it and then you're going to be able to send that data over. That's number one big thing we're going to be doing. The second big thing we're going to be doing is cutting down our code using something called Django's generic views. They are super, super powerful and it makes your code a lot more readable and it stops you from doing the same thing over and over again. Okay. So it makes things a lot simpler for you. It does have a little bit of magic involved, but Hey, that's what I'm here for. And I'm going to break it down. So let's jump right into it. All right. So writing a simple form, I'm going to cop this guy and then I'm going to break it down to you. You, my friend should not be copying. You're learning this stuff. You should be writing this down line by line and going, Hmm, how does this work? Ah, that's how it works. Oh, huh? And then you should be Googling it and looking it up. Okay. For me, I know how this works. I don't want to waste my time. I'm going to copy paste it and then break it down for you. Capiche? Let's get going. All right. So let's pop open our Adam and we will go into our detail.html and we're going to put this over that. Okay. So what is going on at a higher level? We have a, for uh, our heading one. So this is where, what the specific question is. Okay. So what's up, what's cracking, what's popping, things like that. All right. Here, this line is saying, Hey man, look, if there are any error messages, I just want you to freaking show them. That's all. And this guy over here is just a form where you actually submit and vote. Okay. At a high level, that's all that's happening. Okay. Now getting down more into the code level, this is pretty self-explanatory is just H1 tags. It's just HTML. Here is a little bit of Django going on. So here we're saying, if there are, there is an error message, then show it. Okay. And show it covered in strong tags. So it looks nice. And then here's where we're creating a form. So we start the form tag here and end the form tag here. Uh, the action is to go to this specific URL. So trigger this URL. So basically action means what the heck happens when you submit a form, right? What's an example of a form you, um, every, almost every website has it. Okay. So you going on Instagram and logging in, you are submitting a form. You logging in on YouTube, you logging in on Facebook, you are submitting a form. You posting a status hitting post, you are submitting a form. Okay. Uh, so that's essentially what's going on. So what we can say here for action, once you submit a form, what should happen? Okay. One thing you could do here is just type in facebook.com. So once you submit this form, it just takes you to facebook.com. Okay. You can certainly do that. Except in our application, what you want to do is once somebody submits a form, you want to send them over to some other part of your app with that information, with that data. For example, if somebody adds 
uh, shoes to their cart. It then takes them to the new page with the information where they previously added shoes to their cart and then shows the shoes and the shirt and the tie on the proceed to checkout page. Okay, that's essentially how you use forms in real life. Okay, so here we have it to, hey, take me to the vote uh, view, okay, or the vote function in our views file. Cool. Uh, CSRF token, so there's something called cross site. Um, I forget what it uh, fully stands for. Let's take a look at it. They mention it cross site request forgeries. Okay, so it's a security mechanism. And uh, all you have to do is really you don't have to worry about it too much. All you have to do is just add that token. Okay, so actually, that's it. it that token doesn't even need an end. That's it. This is just a line that you add usually when you're adding Django forms, unless you're using something like crispy forms, which is again, outside the scope of this tutorial. So that's what this line is here. We're doing a simple for loop. Okay, the for loop goes through all the question choices. And um, what are question choices? Well, remember each so you have question and then one question can have multiple answers to it those answers are the things that get voted on so what we're doing now is listing out all of those answers or those or, or those choices and uh and 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 i'll show you right now how it'll actually look okay so let's go ahead and check out what this looks like so now we're gonna go over to our app and uh, let's say I click on what's cracking and you can see it says what's cracking followed by vote right underneath it. Okay. Uh, let's go to what's up. What's up has two choices. Remember I had not much and the sky. Those are two possible answers. Kind of funny. I don't know which one I like more. Uh, but yeah, you could you could vote on one and then you could certainly hit vote. Okay. Yours is not going to look as big as mine. That's because I have it zoomed in. So you could see on my 5K iMac retina screen. And you can pick whichever one you want. That's it. And then you hit vote. Boom. Okay. You're voting on question one. It will redirect you to that. Cool. Um, so that was that the radio buttons are coming from these lines. Okay. How's this working? Input type radio. When you do this, then it creates those radio buttons on the side. Okay. I for ID is something you don't have to worry about too much, but for ID, we're just using the built in Django templating systems for loop.counter. So it'll give the ID one, two, three, four as it's looping through. Um, and yeah, value is just the choice.id and uh, name, we're just calling it choice. Name is very important. Once you get this on the server side, the back end, you could reference this post data using that particular name. Okay, so you're gonna be able to do something like request.post bracket choice. Okay, and then label for, uh, that's just for labeling purposes. Again, not incredibly important to what we're doing. And then we end the loop right over here. And then right over here, we're saying this form is, um, uh, basically what we're saying is like, put that submit button and then just call it vote. Okay, so that's why you see, you know, if I called it something else and saved it and refresh, now it calls it that. So here we're saying call it vote. And then for type, we're gonna say it's a submit button. So the type, we're just gonna give it submit. So once you hit it, it sends that information over to the next page. Cool, let's go back to our tutorial. All right, so that's pretty much what it's gonna to explain to us, but let's just see and make sure we're not missing anything. Right, so the value of each radio button is associated, uh, is associated question choices ID. The name of each radio button is choice. Yep, that means when somebody selects one of the radio buttons and submit the form, it'll send the post data choice where number is the ID of the selected choice. This is the basic component of HTML forms. Okay. Uh, we set the forms action to that particular URL and we said method is equal to post. So here's another important thing to note. This is pretty important. Whenever you're generally submitting data uh, or filling out a form and sending it over, you want to use post request 
uh, because it's safer and it's better. You don't want to be using get requests when you're sending data over because it's insecure and uh, you could get screwed. Okay, so simply put, as opposed to get, it's very important because the act of submitting this form will alter data server side. Whenever you create a form that alters your data server side, use method post. This tip isn't specific to Django, it's just good web development practice. For loop dot counter indicates how many times the for tag has gone through its loops. Okay, I've explained this already. Um, since we're creating a post form, we need to worry about cross site request forgeries and I've already gone over this as well. Okay, and that's why we're using CSRF token. All right, now let's create a Django view that handles the submitted data and does something with it. Remember, in tutorial three, we create a URL con for the, that includes this line. So we already have this line, we don't have to add it. So if I go to my URLs.py, you'll see for votes, I have this line right over here, and so should you. All right, now let's add the, now that we're gonna create a real version for our vote. So up until now, we had, functionality for our vote, but it was just dummy placeholder, didn't really do anything, okay? So now we're gonna actually add real functionality. What are the few things we need that we don't have? Let's see, we'll need HTTP response redirect because we don't have that, so we're gonna put that in. All right, we're gonna save. Uh, what else do we need? We need from Django.URLs import reverse, so we're gonna add that in and hit save. Um, and then that's essentially, essentially, and then it, except we're gonna have choice right here. Save, cool. Okay, now we're gonna go in our vote and we need to add all of this code, okay? And I'll break it down for you right about now. Okay, so what's going on here? Question. We get that particular question or we throw a 404 error. We then, um, get the answers for that particular question, okay, or select a choice, uh, one specific choice, that's what we get, okay? So for example, whether the choice is gonna be the sky or whether the choice is gonna be something else, right? Uh, it's not gonna show it to me right now because the app is offline right now, the server is closed, but since we had two choices and you could vote for this choice or this choice, how are you gonna know which one is sent, right? So that's what we're trying to pick here. Um, whichever choice you select the radio button next to, that's whose primary key we're gonna be passing in. And how we get that is request.post choice. Request.post is just a dictionary and you could index, you could get pull out the key choice from that, okay? Um, just to have it make sense, let's see, let's run this code. So what is it saying? The problem is right here. All right, we're gonna run this code. Cannot import name reverse HTTP 404. Let's see where that error is coming from. Aha, right there, reverse, okay. And you could still have HTTP 404, not a problem. All right, so let's go back to our app. Let's go to what's up. And um, also let's go back to this, save it, come back, let's refresh. So it should say vote here. Now when I hit the sky, we're gonna see what happens. So I'm gonna hit inspect here and our console pops up, right? We're gonna go to sources uh, console is looking pretty insane right now, but that's fine. I'm gonna click on network and we're gonna click vote. So we just voted for the sky, okay? Now in our network, uh, so let's see if we can zoom out a little bit because it's a little too crazy. All right, so in our network, we can see that the request method is post, right? and we can actually check out the response. And in this case, it says the response uh, failed. Let's click here. Right now, when I click results, because it was sent to results, it says you're looking at the results of question one, right? So there is a response. And now if I look in the headers, it tells me the request method right now is get, 
and it tells me kind of all the things that go along with it, right? So let's try it out again. Let's uh, pick another question, not much, and vote. Let's see what happens. So 302 found, right? Okay, so let's go here, preview response, fail to re uh, load response data. If I go in results, it's showing me or looking at the results of question number one, okay? So pretty much it says the same thing and it's giving my statuses. What do these mean? We're gonna break it down a little bit later, okay? So let's go back to our tutorial. And go down, index.html. Okay, so this is looking good. Our views, uh, it's looking fine, cool. Now, so yeah, so basically we're selecting the specific um, choice from here, whatever we get, we send over in our request. Um, and then we throw an accept choice that, um, we throw an exception here, okay? Uh, and we also check for if like the choice uh, does not exist or if there's a key error. And in the case that the choice does not exist, we return polls slash detail.html. We render that and we return that question object. And uh, for our error message, we say that you didn't select a choice, okay? So if you somehow selected, you know, nothing. And otherwise, if we have selected it and we haven't ran into this issue, what we wanna say is for that particular choice, we wanna upvote it by one. So we're incre incrementing the vote count by one. We wanna save it and then we redirect, okay? So we're gonna go into more uh, depth of that, but let's just check this part out one more time. Refresh, uh, let's hit inspect. Let's go to network. Let's select the sky, let's click vote. So you can see, okay, so that's, that's exactly what I needed here. It's a little hard to see though. So you can see when I scroll all the way down that it actually pulls out the form data and it's telling me that the choice I selected was the second choice, right? That's the important part. And it also has a CSRF middleware token, which remember we did CSRF underscore token. That's where it's generating that from. But the choice is the most important one. So whether it was choice one or was choice two, and we're picking this based on the choice ID, okay? So that's essentially what's happening. Now, if I go back and I pick not much and I vote, and when I go back up to vote and I go all the way down, you'll see that it's showing me choice one, right? So that's the thing that we're actually pulling out. So this will essentially turn to a one or a two. That's what I was trying to get at earlier, but it was just my screen was too big, so it was hard for me to show it. But that's what gets selected here. And once this evaluates to something like a one or something like a two, this whole thing evaluates to that specific question object. And then we up vote it uh, and then we save it and then we redirect, okay? Uh, the reason why you, so when you're done with all of this, you don't wanna say, hey, go back to the home page or you don't wanna just say like render the home page because if the user refreshes, it'll keep submitting that data over and over again. So like imagine, right? If you were about to pay uh, for your credit card and you buy like uh, whatever, right? You buy shoes or you buy grocery. If you refresh, like something happens during half of it, then it gets submitted, but then you go back and you refresh or you resubmit, it shouldn't let you resubmit and pay again, right? Every time you refresh and then all of a sudden you're charged like $300. Or what if you were on an online trading app and you just put down like $3,000 for Bitcoin and then you refresh or you go back and forward a page and it resubmits $3,000 and $3,000 again, you're gonna run out of money pretty fast, right? $9,000 like that. So it's a pretty serious issue. So what you wanna do instead is redirect. This prevents data from being posted twice if a user hits the back button, okay? Uh, there's a better way to do redirect, which I think they'll show us later, but it's essentially, I think from shortcuts, you can 
pull out redirect and just call redirect and it's much simpler but they do it this way HTTP response redirect reverse and then take me to the results view right so it takes you back to this results view uh, and for argument it just passes in the question ID cool so that's looking good um, now let's play around with it and let's just check out what happens. So I've already voted for like one or two questions multiple times. Let's see what's going on on our database. So I'm going to go in Python manage.py shell. So we're going to do is from polls.models. I'm going to import um, choice. And uh, I'm also going to do from polls.models import question. Question dot objects dot get let's say we want to get our first question or what's up question and we're gonna save this question as like Q or something and now what I'll do is I'll do Q dot choice underscore set dot all now it'll show me all the choices or answers for it and um, then I'll pull out the the sky one and then for the sky one we can see its vote count in models. I forget what is it vote or is it votes? So you can see that it has two votes. And then the other one, third one also has two votes. So it's a tie. Okay. So both have two votes. So you see that what we're doing on our front end and we're voting, it's actually being counted here. Okay. Usually where it says choice underscore set, that's kind of weird. So how you want to say it? is like Q dot choices. And um, again, like I've mentioned in our for at the end of our first video, like if you want to change that, I'm not going to change it now just to stay consistent with Django's official docs. But essentially, like right in here, right, right in the top, we can actually write something called related underscore name, and then fix this issue like right there. Call it something like related underscore name um, and give it uh, choices. Okay, something like that. But we're not going to do it right now. We're going to stick to what Django is doing because otherwise I'll have to make migrations and things like that. And everything is fine for now. I'm going to exit out of this and I will just do Python manage.py run server and just go back to using our regular app. Cool. All right, so now let's see what they want us to do. So that's all good. That's working. All right, let's see what they're saying here. Request that post is a dictionary-like object that lets you access submitted data by key name. Yep. So that's how we we use the choice key name. Request that post values are always strings. Cool. Note that Django also provides request.get. That's by default. That's there. But we're explicitly using request.post in our code to ensure the data is only altered via post call. Um, it will raise a key error if choice wasn't provided in post data. The above code checks for key error right over here. And redisplays the question form with an error message if choice isn't given. After incrementing the choice count, the code returns an HTTP response redirect rather than a normal. Uh, redirect this redirect takes a single argument the URL to which the user will be redirected see the following point for how we construct the URL in this case and uh, you should always return an HTTP response redirect after successfully dealing with post okay we're using reverse function constructor this function helps avoid having to hard code a URL in the view function it is given the name of the view that we want to pass control to and the variable portion of the URL pattern that points to that view. Cool. So right here. Now, after somebody votes in a question, the vote view redirects to the results page for the question. Let's write that view. So now it should point us back to the results and we're going to write it. Okay. So here is what it should be looking like. Let's check our results. Let's pop that bad boy. Oops, let's pop that boy right in here. And we just say get that particular question or otherwise throw a 404 
And once you get it, um, take me to. And once you get that question, take me to results.html. So you can already see there's some similarities, right? Like here, there's a similarity and here there's a similarity. Both of these have to do with getting that one particular question. So think of it like you're getting the uh, result uh, detail view for both of them. But in one, you're sending me to detail.html and the other one you're selling, sending me to results.html, okay? And uh, we're gonna kind of address this issue of like our code being a little bit repeated. This is almost exactly the same as the detail view from tutorial three. The only difference is the template name. We'll fix this redundancy later. So they mentioned that. Now let's create a poll slash results.html. So we're gonna go in uh, and create new file i'm going to call it results.html just like that i'll paste it here and we'll go to our app and we'll vote for the sky and then it'll take us to the results of what's up and look at that not much it says two votes and the sky three votes vote again and then it takes me back to the vote and i'll vote for not much all right so it's coming out pretty cool so far all right it's this is exciting guys this is exciting so now, what is this code saying? Let's read our code that we've just added. Header, unordered list, unordered list. The loop is saying go through all of the choices or all of the answers. I don't know why they call it choice. I just think it's a bad name. And um, get that choices choice text, put two dashes in between it. So for example, this would turn this whole thing would turn into like the sky or not much followed by the number of votes followed by it saying vote choice out votes plurized right so uh, what this is doing is it's either gonna put an s here or a not so for example let's go here so if you only had one vote it wouldn't this would turn into nothing and if you had multiple votes, it would turn into, um, it would put a S here, okay? So it's a pretty cool way of pluralizing something. But you're doing choice.votes, so this will evaluate to like, let's say three, and then you're piping it over to pluralize, and then pluralize will be like, hey, yes, you should pluralize it and put an S here, and then I'll put like an S like that. Okay, cool. With that said, that ends the for loop. So you're doing not too much here. And then what you say is like, hey, you want to vote again? And how, you, how you're how you doing that is you're just providing a link to the uh, text vote again. And it'll essentially take you to the detail view of that particular question. Okay, so if I hit vote again, it takes me to the detail view of that question. What's up? Not much. Vote, it takes me to the results view. If I hit vote again, it takes me to detail view. Click it, takes me to the results view. So this app is starting to have some functionality again. So again, that's pretty cool. Let's go here, let's check out now. Go to poll slash one in your browser and vote in the question. We did. It gets updated each time you vote. If you submit the form without having chosen a choice, you should see the error message. Okay, so let's see if we can try to do that. Let's hit vote. And it says you didn't select a choice. Perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Note the code for our vote view does have a small problem. It first gets the selected choice object from the database, then computes the new value of votes, and then it saves it back to the database. If two users of your website try to vote at exactly the same time, this might go wrong. The same value, let's say 42, will be retrieved for votes. Then, for both users, the new value of 43 is computed and saved, but 44 would be the next expected value. This is called a race condition. If you're interested, you can read Avoiding Race Conditions Using F to learn how you can solve this issue. 
okay, that's a little bit advanced. It would have to be literally at the same like fraction of a second. Could it happen? Yes, if you're trying to scale your app to a lot of users, yes. Should you worry about it right now? Hell no. So let's continue. All right, so remember what I mentioned in our views, some of the code is looking similar like here. These are detailed views, right? They're showing the specific question uh, and they need one specific question. Looks a little redundant, right? And then we're using also a specific question like allowing us to vote here, but these there's a little bit of redundancy going on. So how can we address this? How can we manage this in a better way? Well, luckily for you, Django has something called generic views. These are class-based views that essentially have you, once you use them, you don't even have to write that much real code. It just does a lot of the things automatically in a pretty intelligent way. So I like this and check it out. All right, the detail and results views are very simple as mentioned above, um, but they're redundant, okay? The index view, which displays a list of polls is similar. These views represent a common case of basic web development. Getting data from the database according to a parameter passed in the URL, loading a template and returning the re re rendered template. So we pass stuff and we get it from the URL and then we load up a template and we return the render template. That's essentially what we have been doing. And when I say return the render template, another way to say it is returning that HTML file you're looking for, right? Or that page on the front end that you see. Because this is so common, Django provides a shortcut called generic views system. Generic views abstract common patterns to the point where you don't even need to write Python code to write an app. You could literally be sleeping and the app just writes itself. Let's convert our poll app to use the generic view system. So we can delete a bunch of our own code. We'll just have to take a few steps to make the conversion. We will one, convert the URL conf, delete some of the old unneeded views, and introduce new views based on generics, generic Django views. All right, read on for details. Okay, so why the code shuffle? What they're basically saying is, hey, you should know basic math before you start using a calculator. So why did we do this up until this point only to now refactor our code? Will we have to refactor our code all the time? No, you will not. Next time when you're doing your app, you already know how class-based views work. You'll start from more generic class-based views. So basically what they're saying is like, hey, look, we don't wanna just give you the calculator before you even can do basic two plus two, or in my case, in one of my videos, I think I had to do 2000 divided by 10 on a calculator. That was a pretty sad moment. And uh, that has a lot of upvotes. Makes me sad to this day. I wish my editor took it out. Oh, well, you don't always get what you want in life, but Django generic views comes pretty close. So let's keep going. All right, amend URL conf. First open the poll slash urls.py, URL and conf, then change it like so. So we're gonna go in poll slash urls.py and I'm just gonna paste it over this bad boy and explain what the heck we just changed, right? So besides the fact that we took out some notes, what else just changed? So let me let me take this out so you can kind of see it side by side and really see what changed. So if you look at this index thing, all it changed uh, before it was just dot index. Now it's index view dot as view, detail view as view, results view dot as view and those are the middle arguments that change, right? What are the other arguments that change? Everything after the name, all the name keyword arguments remained the same, but there was something else that changed. So here it says question underscore ID everywhere, but in the new one, it says PK everywhere if you notice, right? So that's another big change to keep in the back of your forehead. All right. That's what they mention over here. Cool. So that's essentially what we're gonna be focusing on here. So here we still have question ID, okay? Now when we're using these generic views, they take things in as PK and they'll explain that later. Now we need to make changes to our views. 
we're going to remove our old index detail and results views and use Django's generic views instead. To do so, open the and change it like so. So we definitely need this generic thing. So we're gonna do we're gonna go to our views and here we're gonna do from Django.views import generic. All right, so we got that. Other things that we need. Now we need to make a class here. So I'm gonna completely remove this guy and add a little class here. How will this work? It'll automatically know which template to use based on this variable. These variables are not just random. You can't just call it this, it will not work. These variables have to have this specific name for them to work. Okay, this is something important for you to remember. Django does have a bit of magic, but once you learn how it works, it'll be really, really helpful, okay? So template underscore name, you have to use this variable. We assign it to the index.html. For context object name, we say latest question list. And for a query set, we're just returning the last five published published options, okay? So this we're saying only be referenced if somebody says this. So when somebody says this, you can get me that. Okay. Let's go in our class detail view. So for our detail, all we need to write is instead of doing this get object 404, passing the question, passing the primary key, all that stuff, and saying render request followed by the context dictionary and all that. It's pretty simple. How is it working? Well, it's actually pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's go back to our URLs. And since we're passing PK right in here, it already has it. You don't even have to pass it as an argument or anything. Which model? Again, these variable names matter. We're telling it, use the question model. So it's directly communicating with this model right over here. Template name, we just give it the template name. And that's it, it knows what to do, okay? Pretty beautiful. Now let's do the same thing for our results view. So it's gonna change from this obfuscated looking code to something pretty simple, check it out. Clean, right? Looks a lot cleaner. No need for request and question ID, no need for get object or 404, uh, no need for passing in question or primary key, no need for saying render request and passing in a context dictionary. It just does it all automatically. And then vote, we're gonna keep it the same. Okay, we're gonna hit save. Now we're using two generic views here, list view and detail view, respectively. Those two views abstract the concept of display a list of objects. That's one concept. So list view is gonna do that. And then the other concept is display a detail page for a particular type of object. So are you looking at the home page of Instagram or are you clicking into one particular post and looking at its detail? Each generic view needs to know what model it will be acting upon. This is providing using the model attribute, which is this. The detail view, generic view, expects a primary key value captured from the URL to be called PK. That's why here it has to be called PK. So we have changed question underscore ID to PK for the generic views, but not for the non-generic view. By default, the detail generic view uses a template called app name slash model name underscore detail dot HTML. In our case, it would use the template, the following template, right? So if I go in my views, pull, so app name, our app name is polls slash results dot HTML. So slash, uh, slash the model name dot HTML, okay? In our case, we just called it results.html. The template name attribute is used to tell Django to use a specific template name instead of the auto-generated default template name. We also specify the template name for the results list view. 
This makes sure that the results view and the detail view have a different appearance when rendered, even though they're both a detail view behind the scenes. So they're both a generic detail view. Okay. Similarly, the list view generic view uses a default template called similar to the other one. We use template name to tell list view to use our existing one. So by using template name right over here, we're telling it which one to use specifically. In previous parts of the tutorial, the templates have been provided with a context that contains the question and latest question list context variables. For detail view, the question variable is provided automatically. So the question variable is provided automatically instead of us even having to pass it in as a context dictionary because generic views are smart. Since we're using a Django model, our model is called question. Django is able to determine an appropriate name for the context variable. That's why it would pull out question. This would be the variable name that you can use automatically on your front end in your templates. However, for list view, the automatically generated context variable is question underscore list. So if it's a list of things, right, like the list of choices or those answers, uh, it would call them question underscore list. To override this, we provide the context underscore object underscore name attribute. So we override it and we give it our own name. If we didn't give it our own name, we'd have to access it using question underscore list. But by giving it our own name, now we can access it on our template side as latest question list. Okay, specifying that we want to use latest question list instead. As an alternative approach, you could change your templates to match the new default context variables, but it's a lot easier to just tell Django to use the variable that you want. Run the server and your new polling app uh, based on generic views. So let's actually give it a try. My server is indeed running. I'm gonna refresh. I'll take a vote and it voted correctly. I'll vote for the sky and it looks like it votes correctly. I will go to the polls like home page, just polls, and it shows me all the detail views for all of them, right? What's new? And when I go on what's up, not only does it show me the detail view, but it also shows me the choices that go along with it. So working fan in a fantastic way. Write your first Django app part five. So what are we doing in this tutorial? Uh, we are going to be doing a lot of automated testing. Okay. So what the hell is automated testing? Well, here, let me break it down in a simple, easy to understand way for you mere mortals out there. Let's say you have something like Amazon, right? Something giant with millions of lines of code. Are you really going to like every time you add a new feature? Are you going to test all of the older features to make sure that they're working correctly? Probably not. It's going to take up a lot of your time. Plus you're going to kill yourself. So what you're going to do is actually write these automated tests. So every time you add a new feature to Amazon, let's say that you add this new cool feature that recommends new shoes. You want to make sure that the ability when user clicks add to cart, that still works. When a user clicks checkout, that still works. So what you would normally do is go and manually test it, except because Amazon is so big, you're not going to be doing that. So you're going to write automated tests. They'll test all of those things every time you add a new feature. So when you add a new feature, it automatically tests everything that was before it. That's the point of testing. Okay. That's kind of the beautiful thing about it. Okay. So why you need to create tests, tests will save you time. Yep, that will save you a lot of time because let's say you were to run into a bug or some unexpected behavior, you will know exactly why it's happening or you'll catch on to it a lot faster if you have code that tests those things as you go along rather than waiting till everything breaks, the whole world comes falling down and then you're like, wait, what went wrong? Yeah, good luck finding the bug in your millions of lines of code, right? You want to quality test each thing as it comes in. Tests don't just identify problems, they prevent them, okay? So this helps you identify any problematic new bugs that could be coming in 
and not only like identify them, but prevent them before it even happens. Almost think of testing kind of like if you just hired people without interviewing them. I mean, you wouldn't know, right? You would hire people like this guy. And you would have people who you would have no control over, don't know. And like, let's say something was going wrong in your company, you're not going to know who to blame because you never really tested any person, right? But if you run through an interview or a test with them, then oftentimes you don't even have to hire them and you can kind of prevent it before that problem spreads. Or if they're awesome, then you can add them in, right, to your company. Tests also make your code more attractive. So basically, like, your code will look nice if you have tests. Otherwise, developers won't take you seriously. And tests help uh, teams work together. So if your team is working and some complex applications will be maintained by teams, right? And tests guarantee that colleagues don't inadvertently break your code and that you don't break theirs without knowing. So this way it also helps when you get employed and you have a job, you know, uh, it'll help you identify like where the problem is coming from and the people who are working with you on your team, they know exactly what you're thinking and won't cause problems in your code either. So those are the benefits of testing. Now you have some basic testing strategies, something called a test driven development. It's a pretty common thing. It's called TDD, TDD, okay. And basically it's like testing as you go rather than wait till I write my millions of lines of code and then freaking test it, right? Wait till I have 30 employees and then I'll ask them and interview them and find out like, don't do that, test as you go, okay? And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna write our first test. So, oh, we identify a bug. Who? look at that. Well, they purposely planted a bug in our code and now we're gonna use testing to solve it, okay? We're gonna go Sherlock Holmes. All right, so fortunately, there's a little bug in the polls application for us to fix right away. The question was published recently. So you guys remember that little method we had was published recently in our models for question? Well, it had a little bug, and basically how it works is the method returns true if the question was published within the last day, which is correct. So if it was within the last 24 hours, it shows you true, but it also shows you true if it was published in the future, okay? So it shouldn't say that it's recent if it was going to happen in the future, right? You wouldn't say, oh, I recently got a car if you're going to get a car 20 years from now when you finally get a job, right? So I'm just kidding. You probably already have a job. I don't. <laughs> Let's continue. To check if the bug really exists using the admin, create a question whose date lies in the future and check the method. Check and check the method using the shell. So first we're gonna check what's going on using the shell, all right? So let's go back to our code. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is run our Python. So we're gonna run that from, we're gonna do python manage.py shell. Don't just do Python and hit enter like an idiot, like I kinda did. So um, once you run the Python with this particular shell, then what happens is you can like import your you know, models and everything. Okay, so now import date time. We're gonna do from django.utils import time zone. And then we're gonna do from polls.models import question. With that said, now we're gonna create a question instance with a publication date 30 days in the future. Okay, so how does this work? We're gonna create a variable called future question and we're gonna create it from the question class and uh, we will say the pub date is equal to time zone dot now. So we're saying that it's published right now. And then, um, but to that time zone dot now, we're gonna add some time to it, okay? So we're gonna do date time dot time delta and we will do days is equal to 30, just like that. Okay, and then we're gonna hit enter. So what I say, I'm saying is like, right now plus 30 days, which in other words translates 30 days from now, right? So basically right now where I am at and what my current day for me is February 20th, okay, 2018. So it's gonna do February 20th plus 30 days after February 20th, okay? So no, it's not gonna be February 50th 
it's gonna be March something, right? Cool. Uh, was it published recently? Now we're gonna ask it, and it should say no, it's not published recently, right? It should return false, except that it returns true. So well, there you have it. We know that something with our code is broken, right? So since things in the future are not recent, this is clearly wrong. Now we're gonna create a test to expose the bug. So right now we expose the bug through the command line, right? We just use the interactive terminal shell, but like you don't wanna be doing that every single time. You also don't wanna be doing that manually every single time. So we're gonna write a test for it. They'll automatically test it for us, okay? Cool. So now we're gonna go into our test file and write this code and then I'll kind of break it down. So in our under our polls app, we're gonna go into our tests and uh, we will paste this guy here, okay? I copied over everything and I pasted it over it. So what's going on? We're importing date time, just like we did in the shell. We're importing time zone, we're importing test case, and we're importing the question model from our models. And how is this working? The class is, we're calling it question model test. Uh, so the good idea is like, every time you wanna test a model, make a class for that test, okay? So this way it's nice and organized. Uh, this class inherits from test case, that's coming from here. You kind of put that in without really thinking about it, okay? Just like look at what the Django docs is saying and then just like follow it all along. It's not necessary for you to like learn about this test case class and how it's being inherited and like get a PhD in it. You can, but it's not necessary. And then um, for your, the name of the function that you're testing, you wanna, a good practice, you wanna like break each thing you're testing, have a function for that particularly, right? So for example, if I go into my models, um, I have a method called was published recently. So since we wanna test that specific method, under that class, look, I'm doing test was published recently, right? And uh, name the test, make it pretty specific. So somebody who's reading your test uh, method or your test function should kind of know what it's supposed to do just from reading the name. So we're testing was published recently, but with future question. So what if the question was like published 30 days in advance, right? Here's the documentation for it. Was published recently returns false for questions whose publication date is in the future. Cool, that's what it's supposed to do, uh, except it doesn't do that. So now we're, we're checking this, okay? We're saying, hey, set the time to 30 days from now. That's what this is doing. And then we make the future question um, just from question class. Um, and then we set the publication date to that particular time from here, line 16. And then on line 18, we're just saying, hey, assert if this is this. However, this turns to true as we saw earlier, right? Like right here. So this is gonna, this whole thing, if you run it right now, is gonna turn to true. And that's really the problem that we're having, right? And we need to fix that. Our test will expose it. How do we run our test? We're just gonna go to our command line and we're gonna do python manage.py test polls. So I'm gonna exit out of this, exit. And uh, now I will simply do python manage.py test polls. So what I'm saying is like test the polls app and then it'll automatically basically run the test.py file inside of the polls app that you created. Run it and look, it says failed, failures is equal to one. And basically it says assertion error. It tried this line, self.assert is, and what it found out was this was not this. And so it's an assertion error and it says true is not false. Now, if this whole thing evaluated to, to false, which is it's supposed to, then it would go false is false. And then this thing would return true and it would throw any errors, okay? Now, as you have more and more tests in here, all you'll have to do is just run that once, or you can set up a way where it runs that once automatically, and that way it'll only alert you if something is broken, otherwise it'll just go silently. That's the beauty of tests. Uh, by the way, have you guys ever heard the song Fly Me to the Moon by Fly Frank Sinatra? Oh my God, like, I've been in love Let with it, and I can't stop thinking about it. It's like playing in my head nonstop. 
anyways, let's continue. So what happened is this. Uh, Python managed that PY test polls looked for tests in the polls application. And I've explained that to you already. It found a subclass of the Django that tests a test case subclass. It created a special database for the purpose of testing. Uh, if I go here, look, it says destroying test database. So it created its own database from what was happening right now. It looked for test methods, um, ones whose ones whose names begin with test. Okay, so it's looking for everything that starts with test. If you don't have these starting with test, it won't find it, okay? So like, let's just say it was like this and I'll hit save and then we'll also run this test polls and it didn't even find it. It said it ran zero tests in zero seconds. But as soon as I do that, and if I run it, boom, ran. Um, it created a, in test was published recently with future question. It created a question instance whose publication field is 30 days in the future, right over here. And using the assert is method discovered that it was published recently returns true, though we wanted to return false, what we found out here. Cool. The test informs us which test failed and even the line on which the failure occurred. So here, uh, it'll tell us which line we failed on, line 18, right? This is line 18. Cool. So now we're going to go ahead and fix this bug. How are we going to fix it? Well, this is the code that we're, that's going to help us fix it. We already know what the problem is. Amend the method in models.py so it will return true if the date is also in the past. So we're going to go into models and uh, we will change this to this. Indentation and white space in Python is important, so make sure it's indented correctly. Underneath this was published recently method. And um, basically we're saying, hey, set the time zone to now, like exactly right now, and then subtract uh, one day from now. If that's less than or equal to the published, um, and check if that's less than or equal to the self.publish date. Okay, so if that's less than or equal to the published date, um, and then check if self.publish date is less than or equal to now. Okay. So in other words, check that this publication date is in between this and this. Does that make sense? It has to be sandwiched between the two. And run the test again. So now I'm going to hit save and I will simply run the test again. And now look, it says ran one test and it gave me an okay. And it's saying destroying the database. So cool. It looks like it had no errors. It ran all the tests successfully. If it showed me something red or said failures, I'd know something uh, failed. So now it's working. Cool. Now we can also do after identifying a bug, we wrote a test that exposes it and corrected the bug in the code so our test passes. Many other things might go wrong with our application in the future, but we can be sure that we won't inadvertently reintroduce this bug. So it'll automatically keep checking it and we we're not going to be reintroducing this bug because we'll always find it because simply running the test will warn us immediately. We can consider this little portion of the application pinned down safely forever. Pretty cool. I think that's pretty freaking cool. And now they're like, all right, we're going to get into some more comprehensive tests. <laughs> While we're here, we can further pin down the was published recently method. In fact, it would be positively embarrassing if in fixing one bug, we had introduced another. Cool. Add two more test methods to the same class to test the behavior of the method more comprehensively. So now we're gonna test um, was we're gonna test the was published recently method with old question, and then we're also gonna test it with recent question, and we already have the future question. So you can only have three cases: future question, recent question, or old question. If a question is older than one day, um, it should basically say that it's not um, 
If the question is older than one day, it will, should return false. It should say it's not recent. If it's uh, in the future, it should say it's not recent. If it's been posted less than one day, then it should say it's recent. So for example, if we just look at this test code at a high level, old question, look, it's ask, it's making sure that it's asserting to be false. Um, so if it's one day and one second ago, right? So if it's one, if it's exactly one day ago, then what it should do is it should say, yes, it's still true. But if it's one day and one second ago, now it should say it's too late and it should be considered false. Okay, it should be considered not recent. And then publish recently with recent or with recent question. So if the question is, as you can see here, not even one day ago, 23 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds ago, almost one day, it should assert it to be true, okay? And take these and we will go into our tests and uh, we will add this into our tests, okay? There we go. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so just make sure that it's all indented correctly and then that sh you should be good there. So now we have all of those scenarios covered. Future, old, or recent question. Let's run our test and let's see if we have any bugs. No bugs. It looks like our method is working perfectly. Okay. Uh, just so you understand this code right here, It'll only return true when the publication date is in between this and that. Okay, so this is basically saying it's within one day um, and this is saying it's um, less than now. Okay, so if this is in between, it'll match. And now we have three tests that confirm the question was published recently, returned sensible values for past, recent, future questions. Good. Again, polls is a simple application, but however complex it grows in the future and whatever other code it interacts with, we now have some guarantee that the method we have written tests for will behave in expected ways. Test of view. So you can also test views. The polls application is fairly undiscriminating. It will publish any question, including ones whose publication date field lies in the future. We should improve this. Setting a publication date in the future should mean that the question is published at that moment, but invisible until then. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, when we post our question, if it's some date in the future, it shouldn't show it. Just like, for example, on WordPress, if you publish a blog post for, let's say, you know, two days later, it doesn't show until two days later, right? You can schedule your post. Or on YouTube, sometimes I schedule my videos. And, you know, I'll say, show this video to the audience in one week from now, right? So if I do show it from one week from now, I shouldn't be showing it at that same time. That would be crazy. That wouldn't make sense. Just like that, we also want to do with our questions and make sure that it doesn't just show out of nowhere and we wanna make a test for a view. When we fix the bug above, we wrote the test first and then the code to fix it. In fact, that was a simple example of test-driven development, but it doesn't really matter in which order we do the work. In our first test, we focus closely on the internal behavior of the code. For this test, we want to check its behavior as it would be experienced by a user through a web browser, okay? So the first one, it was like the logic of the code. This one, we're focusing on what happens if the user is like, testing it and the user is actually on the front end of the website what does it show to them and isn't that cool that you can automatically test that every time your code runs and you don't have to like go and check if your cart is working or your blog is showing things like that all right so the django test client so here's a command we're going to go in our command line and type in so i'm going to copy this guy again and uh, remember, we got to do Python, manage.py shell, then paste this guy. 
and then we will get setup test environment just like that okay um, installs a template renderer which will allow us to blah 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 okay we will get this guy and then we will uh, also this say something about time zone so make sure your time zone is correct uh, mine is in America slash Los Angeles if I go in my settings and show you for you it might be something different so you can go in this go to this link and look up what your time zone is okay So we're gonna import the client and then we're gonna create an instance of the client. So here we're creating an instance. And now we can get a response from our home page. Now, when the response from your home page should give you something like not found or a 404, it's because if you go to your home page, there's nothing there, right? If you just go to um, right now, your local host 127.0.0.1 colon 8000, it should give you an error. The only routes that are mapped is like if you go to slash admin or if you go to slash polls. Remember that. So that's why the home is giving us a 404 right now. We should expect a 404 from that address. Uh, let's just do response.status code, and here it is 404. Uh, we should expect to find something at polls though, okay? So let's ch try that. We'll use reverse rather than a hard-coded URL. So instead of doing like, you know, whatever slash polls, we're gonna just do a reverse here. Okay, so from Django, we're gonna import reverse. And we'll paste this guy right here. And now if we do response.status code, it shows me something. If I do response, it's saying template response status code is 200. And it's a text slash HTML file, which it is. Okay. And now we can also get the content. We can do response.content. So now it's showing me the content of that file. And if you remember, we do have uh, an unordered list in the start. And then we have bullet points. So here you have what's cracking. In HTML to show an apostrophe, they have to do this. Ampersand, number sign, 39, semicolon. That's basically um, apostrophe. And uh, we also have our other question, what's new? And you can see their links here as well. Okay. So this is like just showing the code version of what the user or we actually see on the front end. And uh, we can also do response.context and get the latest question list. And look, it gave us the questions. What's cracking? What's new? What's up? Now we can improve our view as well. The list of polls, sh the, the list of polls shows polls that aren't published yet. Those that have publication date in the future, let's fix that. So, right, that's a problem. So we need to fix that. We introduce a class-based view based on list view. So we're going to go ahead and fix things in there. Now we need to amend it. So let's go to our views and our index view. We need to fix this. And change it so that it also checks the date by comparing it with timezone.now. First, we need to add an import. So at the top of our code, we're going to add this here. Import time zone. And then our query set, we're going to change it a bit. So where is our query set? All right. Can we put this on one line so it looks slightly less confusing? Yeah, we're fine. We're not following PEP 8. We're running across a little bit. But according to my boy, Raymond the OG Hedinger or Hedinger, uh, you know, according to him, he says 90 to 95 characters should be good enough. Uh, Pep 8, I think, with the whole 80 character line is kind of stupid. Because honestly, breaking this down into new lines messes up the code readability. But right now, this looks pretty easy to read if you just have it much easier if you just have it on one line. Anyway, okay, what is it doing? 
it returns the last five published questions, not including those set to be published in the future. All right. So how is it doing that? It's taking the questions model. It's finding all the objects and it's filtering those objects and only finding the following. Okay. Um, this statement here, it's looking at the publication date and it's only finding, so this underscore underscore LTE means you're doing a reverse search and you're saying less than or equal to, that's what LTE means, less than or equal to. So any publication date that was less than or equal to the current time, meaning only past or current posts, filter those. And then once we find those, we order those by descending publication date, so which one was the most recent ones, and then we show the first uh, five. That's it, okay? A lot going on. And now we can also test our new view. So now you can satisfy yourself that this behaves as expected by firing up the run server, loading the site in your browser, creating questions with dates in the past and future, and checking that only those that have been published are listed. You don't want to have to do that every single time you make a change that might affect this. So let's create a test based on our shell session above. C shells, C, what is it? C, she sells seashells down the seashore. Okay, add the following to polls slash test.py. Polls test. All right, we're adding reverse. Boom. And we'll create a shortcut function to create questions as well as a new test class. So this will create questions for us. Cool. Since this is not going to be a method, it's going to be a function. We're going to put it outside like that. Uh, this will create questions. How will it create questions? You give it a question text and you give it days. And then what it does is um, it'll create a question with that number of days in the future or with that number of days in the past based on whether you pass in a positive number here or a negative number here or something like zero, okay, right here. And then it goes into question.objects and it creates that object in questions class. Uh, and for the question text keyword argument, it passes in question text. And for the pub date uh, keyword argument, it passes in the time which it gets from here. Cool? Cool. Um, okay, so question view index, what are we doing there? Question view, question index view test. So we're creating a new class here. So I'm gonna go right there and paste it and save. So now we're creating tests for our index view um, instead of model. Okay, so this is our model test. And what we're saying is like test no questions. If no question exists, an appropriate an appropriate message is displayed. So if I go into my views and you can see um, in my views, let's see, is it there, is it not there? Or is it in our, H I, yeah, I think it's in our HTML, right, index. So here you can see it says, if there are recent questions and show them, else say no polls are available. So we want to test that it actually does say no polls are available on our front end. We can actually do that and right here and we say, hey, first check that the status code for this page is a 200, meaning that you actually find this page. Second, test that that response that you find, it contains no polls are available. Okay, so right now, remember, we have no questions at the moment. And then also uh, make sure that the cert query set is equal to res the response um, is equal to the following. So this thing, latest question list should be empty. That makes sense, right? That means there are no questions. So it should say no polls are available and it should check that this is actually just an empty list. Cool. Now what we want to do is uh, test past questions 
Okay, again, this could go on. Could this go on one line or this will be too crazy? This is pretty crazy, so I can I can break that up a little bit. No, it's fine. Still readable for me. Okay, so we're saying um, if we create a question, okay, again, this creates its own database, so it doesn't have our what's cracking and whatever tests available anymore. For these tests, it creates its own database and then it destroys that database afterward. So within this database, we're creating a question and uh, the question text will be called past question instead of what's cracking or what's popping or whatever. And uh, we're gonna say that it should be 30, it should have been created 30 days ago. Okay, so this is a past question, hence test past question. And then what we're gonna say is, hey response, uh, get that particular page. And once we get that page, we wanna say, hey, is the are the latest questions of that page contain that question and the answer will be yes it does because we just created it right here and if this thing is equal to this then the test should pass uh, we're also going to create a future question so this should test a question 30 days in the future uh, pretty much the same thing and uh, make sure that a response contains no polls are available uh, that makes sense right because if the question is in the future then it shouldn't be available right now so it should say no polls are available and also make sure that the response that context latest question is empty because there are no latest questions it's gonna be posted in the future okay Cool. And let's check this guy with recent and past questions. Again, I think it's a little bit more readable like that. You can break it down like this. That should be fine too, but I like it like this. And uh, basically what we're testing here is that this thing should equal to this thing. And what's going on here? Uh, the doc for this says, so this is test future question and past question. Even if both past and future questions exist, only past questions are displayed. That makes sense too. And how does it work? We create a question 30 days in the past. We create a question 30 days in the future. Question one is called past question. Question two is called future question. Um, we get the polls index page. And then we say that this thing, the latest question list, should only have the past question that was created 30 days ago and not the recent question, and it should match that. And indeed, and it should, right, uh, if we did everything right. We shouldn't get an error if we run this. And then what we need to do is define two past questions. All right, now this is getting a little too big, so let's break this one down now. And you can indent this too. Okay, so what am I saying here? I'm saying, um, so test two past questions. So the questions index page may display multiple questions. So we also wanna see that it doesn't just display one question, it displays multiple ones, right? So we have past question one, which was created 30 days ago. We have past question two, which was created five days ago. We get the polls index page, and then we say, make sure that the question list, um, actually, let's do it like this, because I think it'll be more readable, actually. So we wanna say that this should equal to this, okay? Latest question list should have both of the past questions. Um, why in this order? Because remember, the most recent ones, it shows it first, right? If we look at uh, our views and how it does it, 
ascending order, sorry, descending order, and then the five. So that's why, um, that's why I would show the past question two first, and then this one right here. Cool. Basically, the most recent question it should show all the way at the top. All right, so first is a question, shortcut function, create question to take some repetition. Um, yeah, well, we pretty much went over this whole thing, so we don't have to check that. And so on. In effect, we are using the test to tell a story of admin input and user experience on the site and checking that at every state and for every new change in the state of the system, the expected results are published. Now, that's a really important point. Like. You're telling a story with your test, guys. Like this is what's really important to understand. So if you're working on a team with somebody and somebody's reading through your test, they understand what each of your view is supposed to do and what it's supposed to return. Like so, so, so key. Like if I'm looking at somebody's code, I don't know what the hell it's supposed to do, right? I don't know what the right answer is supposed to be. But if I look at their test and they have like bunch of examples and what the correct answer and the wrong answer should be, and they have these documentations, I totally understand what each function is supposed to do, what each class is supposed to do, and then effectively I'm on the same page, and then I can actually contribute to this project, right? I can go, th that's where you guys hear like, hey, just go ahead and contribute to open source projects. This is one of the ways that you can do that. Understand, look at their tests first, and then, like I can't tell you enough, for those of you who are a little bit more advanced, to understand a library, here's a pro tip. One of the best ways to do it is not just like, instead of just reading the code, go and look at their tests and they will have so many things in there and what it's supposed to do. You'll start understanding how this library is supposed to work and it's how it's supposed to behave. Literally tells a story. Now we want to test uh, the detail view, okay? So what we have works well. However, even though future questions don't appear in the index, users can still reach them if they know or guess the right URL. So we need to add a similar constraint to detail view. Okay, so we don't want to, our users to be able to reach those questions, obviously, because they don't exist. So they shouldn't just be able to go to that particular URL. Okay, like let's say you had a blog post, like um, whatever, your, your blog post is called banana. So it's like john.com slash blog slash banana. If you scheduled it for like a month later, I shouldn't be able to just go to it from the URL. Okay, so what's going on here? We have the detail view, so let's go into our views. Let's go into our detail view. It's right here. What do they want us to do? They want us to create a query set and do this with it, okay? Excludes any questions that aren't published yet. So filter, make sure the publication date is less than or equal to um, then the time zone dot now. That's, that's it, that's essentially it. And those are the only ones you can check pretty cool okay very very powerful again uh, you can see how powerful the generic method is and of course we will add some tests to check that a question whose publication date is in the past can be displayed and now one with a publication date in the future is not so let's go into our tests and let's add the test for this. So again, it's a new class. It should have its own methods and everything, right? So for the index view, we created a class, okay, for those tests. And now for our detail views, we're also creating a class, okay, very important. Now we test future question and we test past question. How do we do that? We create the question five days in advance. Um, we send you to the polls detail uh, page. So like, for example, on Instagram, if you click into a image and it shows you that specific image, 
that's the equivalent in our app of uh, polls detail, a questions detail view. And for the arguments, we give it that questions ID from right here. Uh, and as a response, we get that particular URL and then we say, hey, make sure that the response actually returns a 404. And it will because here's how we told it. And then test pass question. So basically here we're saying um, 404 meaning it doesn't exist, right? So the detailed view of a question with the publication date in the past displays the question's text. So past question, we create the question here. It was created five days ago. Um, we get the URL for the poll's detail and we pass in the ID for the past question. And then as a response, we get that specific URL and then we assert and make sure that it can the response contains the following thing so response and then it should have the question text in there okay so pass question question text cool and uh let's see let us let's see if we're going to be using any more command line stuff we're not so let's go and exit and let's just see right now if our tests are working um, in our poll slash view, something is happening on line 18. What is happening? Ah, okay. It's not indented correctly, obviously. Save, up and enter. And look at that. All our tests ran in here and they all ran successfully. So you can see all these tests have already gotten pretty complicated and they're testing our app pretty thoroughly. You know, this is not something you wanna do manually every single time and you can already see the power of it. All right, ideas for more tests. So. We have to add similar query set re, uh, method to results view and create a new test class for that view. So we can also test results view. Um, it'll be very similar to what we have just created. In fact, there will be a lot of repetition. We could also improve our application in other ways, adding tests along the way. For example, it's silly that questions can be published on the site that have no choices. So our views could check for this and exclude such questions. Our tests could create a question without choice and then test that it's not published, as well as create a similar question with choices and test that it is published. Also, you can have logged in admin users um, who should be allowed to see unpublished questions, but like ordinary visitors shouldn't be. So if you're an admin, right, and you have WordPress blog, and you schedule one in advance, you can see it, but other people can't, just like I can schedule my YouTube videos, you can't see it, I can. Uh, whatever needs to be added to the software to accomplish this should be accompanied by a test. Whether you write the test first and then make the code pass the test, this is uh, the test-driven way of doing it, or work out the logic in your code first and then write a test to prove it. Um, at a certain point, you're bound to look at your test and wonder whether your code is suffering from test bloat, which brings us to the following. So the thing that they say is, uh, when testing, more is actually better, okay? So it might seem that your test is going out of control and there's a lot of like test bloat and you know what, your beautiful, elegant and concise code compared to your test looks so much better. That's totally okay. Tests are supposed to be bulky and a lot um, and they should cover your ass, okay? That's their job. And so they don't have to look pretty. They don't have to look beautiful. They have to tell a story and have to tell it clearly. So it doesn't matter, right? Let them grow. And for the most part, you can write a test once and then forget about it. It will continue performing its useful function as you continue to develop your program. Uh, sometime they will need to be updated just like we had to update uh, ours, telling us exactly which test needs to be amended to bring them up to date so that extent tests help look after themselves. At worst, as you continue developing, you might find that you have some tests that are redundant. Uh, in testing, redundancy is actually a good thing. And even that redundancy is not a problem. Okay, so 
The more you test, the better, and you don't have to go back and wipe anything clean. Uh, as long they're sensibly arranged, they won't become unmanageable. Okay, so the good rules of thumbs, uh, good rules of thumb include the following: you should have a separate test class for each model or view. So for remember, for each of our models, right, our question model, question model test, we had a different class for this, and for each of our views. We actually had a different class for a detail view. We had a different class for our index view. And if we wanted to go further, we could also add a different class for our results view. A separate test method for each set of conditions you want to test. So instead of testing test no questions, test pass question, and kind of like testing it all in one, it's a good idea to uh, break it down into separate different tests each test doing only one job. So here, if no questions exist, an appropriate message displayed. That's what this is, test is supposed to do. This test over here, questions with a publication date in the past are displayed on the index page. So you can see each, each test is trying to do one and one thing only, okay? Um, test method names that describe their function. So, the names themselves should describe the function of the test. Okay, so test no questions, test past questions, test future questions. And once you build this naming convention, you and your team starts understanding it. And most of the times, you guys will be able to just look at each other's tests and know what your app is supposed to be doing or what it's not supposed to be doing. Further testing. This tutorial only introduces some of the basics of testing. There's a great deal more that you can do and a number of very useful tools at your disposal to achieve some very clever things. For example, so this is a pretty cool part. Um, right now, we just kind of tested our back end and a little bit of our front end. But what if we wanted to test our JavaScript and how it loads and literally like moving the mouse, like have the computer move the mouse and select one of the votes and click vote. How does that experience work? How can we test that on autopilot where it happens automatically? Well, there's something called Selen uh, Selenium or Selenium and it's a way to test your HTML uh, actually renders in a browser, okay? So these tools allow you to check not just the behavior of your Django code, but also for example, of your JavaScript and your browser pretty freaking mind blowing. It's quite something to see the tests launch a browser and start interacting with your site as if a human being were driving it. And Django includes live server test case to facilitate integration with tools like Selenium. Okay, so if you want to get more advanced, um, look up Django and Selenium, and you could even look up uh, YouTube videos online and add those kind of tests within your app. If you have a complex application, you may want to run tests automatically with every commit for the purposes of continuous integration. Um, so if you guys know about GitHub and commits, you can make it so that when you're writing the code and as soon as you commit it, um, I, I like to call it like the time machine because that's what Git and version control allows you to do. You can make it so then it tests it on every commit so that if any one of your commits um, you know, fails any of the tests, it'll be like, hey, this is broken. And you'll find out right away before you actually push that code onto GitHub and destroy your life, embarrass yourself, let down your family, and be fired from your job. So that quality control it is itself at least partially automated. A good way, a good way to spot untested parts of your application is to check code coverage. This also helps identify fragile or even dead code. If you can't test a piece of code, it usually means that code should be refactored or removed. That's, those are some big words. Coverage will help to identify dead code. See integration with coverage.py, um, and you can check, you know, what's dead code and what's not. And uh, yeah, so a lot of testing. I hope that you enjoyed that. We're gonna be covering essentially how static files work in Django, okay? And how you can use them to customize your app's look and feel, okay? So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. 
Okay, so writing your first app part six, right? So how, how what are we doing now? Now we've built a tested web poll application. If you haven't done that, go back to part five. If you haven't done part five, go back to part, part four. Uh, make sure you're following this in order. And uh, now we'll now add a style sheet and an image, okay? So aside from HTML that your app generates, right, and shows, which is, you know, your front end, so far the voting thing that we have where it shows some text with radio buttons, your website needs to be able to do other things too, like show people images or pictures of cats or blog post images. It also needs to be able to serve up JavaScript if you have any JavaScript, right? So for example, if you don't know what JavaScript is, it's totally fine. But like anytime you're clicking a button and it like pops up a menu kind of thing, that's usually JavaScript going on there, okay? Um, if you click something like a pop-up comes up, that's JavaScript. JavaScript is pretty much everywhere. So your website needs to be able to show some JavaScript and uh, it also needs to be able to serve CSS, okay, which is uh, it's called cas stands for cascading style sheet. And you use this to stylize your app and make it look cool and beautiful, okay? And uh, yeah, so that's usually what's necessary to complete a web page. In Django, we refer to these files as static files. Now for small projects, right, this isn't a big deal because you can just keep the static file somewhere where your web server can find it. However, in bigger projects, especially those comprised of like multiple apps, right? So if you have multiple apps like polls and blog and e-commerce, like whatever, dealing with the multiple sets of static files provided by each application starts to get tricky. That's why Django.contrib.staticfiles is there for you. If you're a beginner, don't worry about this part too much, but this is for more advanced people I'm mentioning this part, okay? Otherwise, I'd kind of skip over it. Uh, it collects static files from each of your applications and any other places you specify into a single location that can be uh, that can easily be served in production. Okay, so now let's get to customizing your app's look and feel. So first, we're gonna need to create a directory called static in your polls directory, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. I will open up Adam. And we will go in our polls. Hopefully you can see that on the left-hand side. I don't know how to make that bigger, so I'm sorry about that. But yeah, we're gonna go inside of our polls. And inside of our polls, I think this is where it wants us to make it. So I'm gonna right-click this polls, not the templates one. So right-click uh, right here, create a new folder, and call it static. Done. Okay, cool. And for those of you wondering, like, how do I switch like that? It's command and tab. And on Windows, that's alt and tab. Cool. Django will look for static files there, similarly to how Django finds templates inside polls templ poll slash templates. So you know how there's like polls slash templates and Django automatically looks for templates there? Well, just like that, for your static files, Django is going to look inside of your folder static. Okay, so Django static file setting contains a list of finders that know how to discover static files from various sources. One of the defaults is app directories finder, which looks for a static subdirectory in each of the installed apps. Okay, so um, Django will automatically look for a folder called static under each of the installed apps. Okay, so right now we have polls as one of our apps that we created. And remember to install this app, we had to do this line in our settings file under installed apps. Um, and then now Django is able to find its static folder. If you have another app, again, like a blog app, and you have static folder under there and you install the blog app, then you'll be able to, then Django will be able to find the blogs blog apps, static files, okay? Like images, JavaScript, CSS, uh, those are all considered static files. All right, the admin uses the same directory structure for its static files. Cool, so admin site works the same way. Within the static directory you have just created, create another directory called polls. So inside of static, we're gonna create another directory and we're going to call it polls. 
Okay, so kind of like how you have polls, templates, polls, you're going to have polls, static polls. Okay, similar. And then inside of here, we're going to create a file called styles.css. So I'm going to do new file and I'll do style.css just like that. Okay, so this is our CSS. Um, again, in the command line, if you haven't activated your virtual environment, make sure to do conda or sorry, source activate my sites if you haven't done that just in case you need to do something in the command line which you're not gonna in this video I don't think um, because of how the app directories finder static files finder works you can refer to this static file in Django simply as poll slash styles CSS similar to how you reference the path for templates so remember how for templates you just go poll slash index .html. well for this is poll slash style dot CSS okay and um, for namespacing, it's just like templates. So the same reason why you put um, templates under a f uh, the same reason why you make a new folder called polls under templates is the same reason why you create a uh, another folder called polls under static. It's so then if you have multiple different apps, there's no collision based on like you having the same name for any of your CSS files or any of your HTML files. That's what they're saying here, okay? Now we're gonna do some fun uh, CSS stuff, okay? And we're gonna keep it pretty simple. So in our style.css, what I'm basically saying is that any link tag under um, a bullet point or a listed thing, uh, color it green, okay? So A stands for, like A is like your link tags, anything that contains a link. Basically we're turning, for now we're turning almost all of our links on our current site green next add the following at the top of polls slash templates slash polls slash index.html so we're going to go in our templates polls index.html and at the top what we're going to add is we're going to say load static so we're going to add that right here load static so what this is now able to do is load our static files and then right here I'm gonna add this. So uh, I'm created. A, I'm creating a link to a style sheet. The type is text slash CSS, and the link is this. Now I'm using the link in a dynamic way. Uh, this is the best way to link it instead of like hard coding the actual path. And you just say pull slash style dot CSS. Okay, that's how we refer to it, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so now let's go to our, our website. So I'm going to do python manage.py run server. And um, we're going to open up a new tab and I'm going to go 127. That's slash 8000. Or I'm sorry, slash polls. And you can see that all the links are green, right? If I go back to my style sheet and turn it into something else. So let's go back into Sorry, style.css is right there. I'll bring it here. If I change this to like blue, save, command S, go back here, refresh, you can see that all of this is now blue. If you didn't turn blue, uh, close out of your server, or break the server with control C, and then try it again and it should be fixed. Um, and yep, there we go. And also make sure to save, okay. And another way to go to this same link is doing HTTP localhost colon 8000 slash polls, okay? And that should take you localhost colon 8000 slash polls is the same thing as your 127.0.0.1 colon 8000. Do the same thing. All right, so that's essentially how we got that to work. Let's bring this guy here. Now we also can add a background image, okay? So we'll create a subdirectory for images, create an images subdirectory. So basically inside of our static and polls, we're gonna create um, static polls, we're gonna create a new directory and we're gonna call it images. This is where we're gonna put all of, all of our images. So it should look like this and then you can put whatever image you want, right? Background.gif or, so what we'll do is we'll go online and like grab an image. So let's uh, 
get cats. Right click and then just uh, save the image. And you can save it whatever you want. I'm just gonna call it like cat background. Um, oh, sorry, we can't just save it wherever we want. I'm gonna save it under my site, my site, uh, or sorry, polls, static, polls, images, and I'm gonna save this cat underscore background and it's automatically a .jpg file because I have the format selected like that. I'm gonna hit save. It's saved, I'm gonna open up my Atom and uh, under images, I now have my cat background.jpg. So let's go back to the tutorial. Um, and it's basically saying to do this, add this to your style sheet. So I'm gonna add this now. I'm gonna say, so from images, instead of background.gif, mine is called uh, cat underscore background.jpg like that. So now it's gonna find, basically in our HTML code, it's gonna find anywhere we have the body tag, it's gonna make its background this cat image, okay? So if I go to, um, you know, our index.html, if any of this stuff is in a body tag, it'll add that to the background. So let's check it out. It says, and you should see the background loaded in the top left of the screen. Okay, let's give it a try. Let's see if they're in line, and there you go. It's there, right? Um, so pretty cool how it works. And uh, what I could also do is I could go to my index.html and like wrap maybe a certain part of it in the body tag. So like maybe the part that's in the for loop, right? So I can um, I can go like body tag and I can choose to close the body tag outside of this unordered list. So I can go body like that, okay, if I want to. And I go back, I refresh, and the same thing. Okay, so this is essentially like a little bit of how HTML and CSS like talk with each other. Okay, and uh, now let's look at kind of their last notes here. So they're, okay, so warning. Of course, the static template tag is not available for use in static files like your style sheet, which aren't generated by Django. So in your CSS file, you can't use something like static, like that. It's not gonna know what that is. And you can't do like if then statements here. These are just your static files, hence they're not dynamic and can't do like variables and cool stuff, right? Like your index, uh, your HTML file can, with the, uh, which has the Django templating system in, uh, in there. You should always use relative paths. So here we're not using like slash user slash clever programmer slash GitHub slash my site slash my site or slash polls slash um, what else is it? Static slash polls slash images, right? We're not using the absolute path. That's the definition of absolute path. We're using a relative path to it, um, to your static file between each other because then you can change static underscore URL. So this is again a little bit more advanced. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over this one, but you can read that if you want. And uh, that's essentially how you work with uh, general like static files on Django. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope it was informative and juicy and you loved it. If you did love it, please leave a comment please like it and uh, share it with at least one friend because if you have at least one friend or family member, sorry, what's happening with my mic? If you have one friend or one family member who's doing development alongside you, is gonna boost your success rate up by at least 60%. They have like scientific studies on this. So share it, maybe somebody will watch it alongside and you will become web developers together. 